What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Izuku with System Quirk. Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Without waiting for anyone to respond, the bunny-eared woman Mirko focused her gaze on Izuku, asking, So, you're the brat who wants to be my intern? Recovering from his stupor, Izuku became serious answering, Yes, in a firm tone. Crossing her arms and nodding, Mirko left Izuku at a momentary loss as she asked, You wearing anything under those pants? Before Izuku could respond, Nizu interjected, stating, Miss Mirko, please do not harass my students. Even if you simply wish to check the muscle definition of his legs, now is neither the time nor the place for you to do so. Clicking her tongue, Mirko asked, What's the problem? Before giving her muscular thigh a slap, adding, Female heroes are pretty much expected to show off our legs, not to mention our other assets. I just want to see if he's worth the time I'll have to spend away from defeating villains. I don't have time to babysit a brat. Preempting Mizu's response, Izuku surprised the mouse-like principal and Tashinori alike by unfastening his belt and promptly dropping his trousers. His primary focus during his training was running, core, and leg exercises, so he was confident in their definition and tone. Adopting her characteristically predatory grin, Mirko mused, Oh, you're a bold one, aren't you? Now flex. I want to see those quads on the verge of bursting. Before complying with Mirko's demands, Izuku turned to Nizu, smiling wryly as he said, Sorry if I damage your office. Before channeling the power of one for all into his legs. He was pretty sure Mirko was trying to get a feel for his power. So he settled for a multiplier he could hold for a few seconds, amplifying his physical attributes by 200x as he flexed the muscles in his thighs. Though the definition of Izuka's thighs wasn't lacking before, their size increased quite a bit. More impressively, a discernible shockwave spread through the room, creating a wind pressure that smacked Mirko's smiling face, while simultaneously snapping the elastic bands of his boxer brief's leg holes. Not light with her praise, Mirko candidly remarked, You've got some juicy thighs, kiddo, like something straight out of a two-piece meal. But check these puppies out. Striking a pose like a bodybuilder, hands behind her head and abdominal muscles on full display, Mirko flexed her thighs to their limits, producing a shockwave of her own as her already meaty alters inflated by nearly 30% their original size. Holy crap! Though Izuku, his eyes wide and visibly bulging from their sockets. Seemingly satisfied with Izuka's response, Mirko gave a prideful humph before adopting a more relaxed posture. Arms crossed and chest slightly puffed out as she stated, You still have a long way to go. Though, since you're a guy, I suppose that's your limit. Any bigger and you'll crush your balls and have to deal with chafing. Inserting himself back into the conversation, Nisa's expression and tone were chastising as he muttered, Miss Mirko? In a warning tone, waving her hand dismissively, Mirko replied, Yeah, yeah, I know. Then, focusing her gaze on Izuku, she added, You show promise, kid. You don't strike me as one of those wannabe heroes who can't accomplish anything without boring strategies or greater numbers. A bona fide power type that overwhelms his enemies with raw unadulterated strength. Without giving Izuku a chance to respond, Mirko nodded, seemingly in response to her own assertion, before adding, I've made up my mind. If it's just a week, I don't mind showing you the ropes and teaching you how a solo hero performs their duties. Once your internships start, head over to Okinoshima, the island east of Hiroshima and north of Omishima, 
You can get there via ferry, swimming, or if you're really hot crap, leaping over to it directly. I don't bother keeping track of dates and stuff, so just walk around the forest or busy yourself with training. I'll eventually notice you. Finished with what she had to say, Mirko turned away, quipping, See you when I see you, chicken legs, as she sauntered out of the room. Izuka's eyes nearly lowered to take in her half-exposed, exceptionally toned but cheeks, but having snuck a peek at Mirko's status, he figured it probably wasn't the wisest idea. Name. Rumi Yusujiyama. Quirk Rabbit. Current level. 83. Effective level. 219. Attributes. Strength. 388. Agility. 442. Vitality. 647. Intelligence. 39. Dexterity. 460. Luck, 219. Though Mirko was as dumb as a brick, her level and physical attributes were among the highest Izuka had seen. However, as her quirk rabbit was a mutation type, he wasn't too surprised. Such quirks impacted the physical appearance, physique, and in many cases, the personalities of those who possessed them. The latter was especially true for those with quirks related to animals, as they often inherited the habits and instincts of the animals they represented. As he was focused on the information about Mirko's rabbit quirk, Izuka didn't hear the principal calling out to him until Tashinori placed a hand on his shoulder saying, you should probably pull up your trousers with an awkward smile on his face. With one of Nizu's surprises being that they had already contacted his mother and had a professional moving company relocate all their stuff. Izuka made his way to what would be his new abode, presumably until the dorms were built. Staring up at the modern two-story villa the school and prepared for him and his mother, Izuka couldn't help thinking, that beautiful little chimera is way too awesome. Though the outside was somewhat spartan, having white walls, dark gray windows, and a shingled roof, Izuka could easily imagine the house going for 400 to 500 million yen based on his market research. The total flooring area came out to around 340 square meters, but if he included the garage-like workshop Nizu had prepared for him, it was closer to 400. Resisting the urge to check out the workshop immediately, Izuka pressed his hand to the biometric scanner next to the front door. UA recorded the biometric data of each of its students for a variety of reasons, so Izuka's profile was already saved to the house's state-of-the-art security system. Thus, after a second or two had passed, Izuka's excellent hearing let him pick up on a series of mechanical clicks, followed by the front door sliding open with a hissing sound. When he inspected the door's profile, it was at least 8 centimeters thick and had at least 6 layers. Also, much like a vault, instead of a simple latch, it had several thick bars that protruded from the top and bottom of the door, fixing it in place when closed. Before Izuku could finish investigating the building's security, the sound of someone running reached his ears, followed by his mother flying down the stairs, shouting, Izuka-chan, look at our new home, with tears and a bit of snot streaming down her face. After Izuka's rejection, the effort Inko put into her yoga and calisthenics had diminished. She still exercised for around 20 minutes each day, but she had become noticeably plumper, particularly around her butt and thighs. It was impossible to call her fat. Rather, as she snuggled against him and gave him a big hug, Izuku was briefly reminded of Toru. Suppressing that notion before an accident could occur, Izuku returned his mother's embrace, giving her a firm squeeze and patting her back a few times before loosening his hold. She continued embracing him for a while longer, but after calming down, she abruptly became excited before dragging him around for a house tour. This included a large living room, a restaurant-quality kitchen, a small laundry room, an onsen-like bath for bedrooms, three bathrooms, a loft, an in-ground pantry that led to a panic room, and, of course, Izuka's private workshop, rigged with enough state-of-the-art equipment that May would probably try to sneak her name into the Midoriya family register. With school being closed the day after the sports festival, Izuku had nothing to do but lounge about. Nizu had given him a glimpse of the funds he had access to, assets exceeding 10 trillion yen, so he no longer had any need to earn money. Rather, 
If his net worth were made public, he would be one of the richest people in the world. 10 trillion yen was equivalent to 77 billion USD. So unless he began spending like a madman or made some extremely terrible investments, he couldn't even put a dent in the interest he was collecting. As Izuka was pondering making a few anonymous donations to some in-need charities, his phone vibrated. This was fairly normal, but the moment he heard it, Izuka's eyes widened as he leaped from his bed, grabbing his phone and checking it within three seconds. Seeing several messages asking where he was, a wry smile developed across Izuka's face as he remembered his promise to celebrate with his classmates. The various surprises Nizu had given him the day before, not to mention his very peculiar meeting with Mirko, had caused him to forget. However, before hopping in the shower, washing up, and getting dressed, Izuka's eyes gleamed as he noticed the DMs from Toru, complete with a little paper clip icon that denoted she had sent him an attachment, feeling a knot form in his throat. Izuku swallowed it down before opening the message with a fair amount of expectation. To his surprise, instead of an image, the attached file had an MP4 extension. In other words, it was a video staring intently at his screen. Izuku scanned his fingerprint and waited for the video to load. Once it had, the familiar sight of Toru's pink room came into view, specifically focused on her bed. More noticeable, however, was the lingerie floating atop it, an incredibly racy set of white lace that looked like something a girl would wear during their honeymoon, complete with a garter belt and stockings to highlight Toru's legs. Are you watching this, Izuku? asked the Toru from the video, prompting Izuku to lower the volume of his phone as a precaution. My body has been burning up since this afternoon. Explain Toru adding, it's embarrassing to admit, but I regret not taking things further. That's why I've decided to start a new training regimen. Would you like to see how far I've come? Since Izuku obviously couldn't answer her, Toru sat up, placing her phone on a stabilizer at the edge of her bed. Then, with her legs spread in an impose, the outline of a hand entered her pants, seemingly trying to get at something rather than simply touching herself. Just as Izuka's curiosity peaked, Toru pulled out something clear from her pants, holding it up to reveal a small, crystal clear dill with a T-shaped stopper. It's a bit small, remarked Toru, her voice exuding a sonorous underdown. But I don't want to risk damaging something that ought to be torn by the boy I like. Though it was difficult to determine exactly what she was doing, Izuku imagined Toru had brought the d up to her lips as the top half abruptly disappeared. When it reappeared a few seconds later, accompanied by a loud pop, Toru seemed to hesitate for a moment before saying, if you're not busy right now, I could sneak out or tell my parents I'm going to meet up with some friends from school. Then, instead of practicing on my own, we could train together. Pausing the video to check when Toru had sent it, an exasperated sigh emanated from Izuka's throat when he noticed it was from the previous afternoon, particularly around the time he was speaking with Nizu and Tashinori. Fortunately, before he could lament the missed opportunity too much, Izuka noticed Toru's most recent test, stating, if you have nothing going on after the party, want to rent a karaoke booth? I've been meaning to show you the full range of my vocal cords. I'm really good at hitting the high notes. This little minx, muttered Izuku, even as his fingers rapidly typed his response. It would depend on when the party ended, but if it were still early enough in the evening, he wouldn't mind accompanying her for a few hours. Not in the slightest. After a short train and taxi ride, Izuka found himself on a private road circling a massive gated estate, complete with its own forest, a private lake, and a European-style mansion that kind of reminded Izuku of the White House. I wonder if I could afford something like this, muttered Izuku, then, immediately dismissing such thoughts, he pressed the intercom on the ornate sliding gate bearing the name Yairozu. A few seconds later, a female voice asked, Yes, how may I be of assistance? Since he didn't recognize the voice, Izuku presumed it to be one of Yairo's servants answering, My name is Izuku Midoriya, 
I'm here to attend the class, one, a post-festival celebration. Without hesitation, the voice responded. Ah, yes, Ojisama has been expecting you. Please wait there or walk along the main road leading to the estate. One of the servants will arrive shortly to escort you. That won't be necessary, replied Izuko, adding, I'll be there in a few seconds. Then someone will be at the front door to receive you, responded the woman, promptly cutting the connection the moment she was finished. As Izuku was the last to arrive, the other members of Class 1A, Sans Todoroki, were waiting for him in an enormous dining room housing a large fireplace, multiple chandeliers, and a rectangular table more than 20M in length. Oh, hey, Midoriya Kuen, it's about time the man of the hour showed up, exclaimed Kurushima, the first to notice Izuka's entrance. Spurred by Kurushima's remark, most of the other members of class 1A offered greetings of their own. Yairozu, in particular, came right up to him, smiling radiantly as she said, Welcome to my family's summer villa, Midoriya Kuen. It pleases me that you were able to make it. Resisting the urge to ask if this was really just the Yairoza family's summer dwelling, Izuku returned a smile of his own, responding, I'm thankful for the opportunity, both to be here and to see you in casual clothes. Very nice. Contrasting the school uniform Izuku usually saw her in, Yairozu was wearing a short-sleeved red polo over some white, form-fitting shorts that displayed most of her creamy white legs and thighs. She liked to be able to use her quirk at a moment's notice. So, short sleeve shirts, shorts, and skirts were her goddess when it came to casual wear. Cupping her right cheek, Yairozu exuded a bit of error energy as she said, Oh, Midoriya Cohen, ever quick with the compliments, I see. Not that I don't appreciate them. Raising his brows slightly, Izuka remarked, I see you're in a particularly bubbly mood today. Adopting a radiant smile, like a cool summer day, Yairozu explained, This is the first time I've brought friends over. The mansion is usually very quiet, so it's nice to have so many people present. As her grandfather was part of I Island's board of directors, and her parents were constantly traveling around the world to support various humanitarian efforts, Yairozu often lived alone. She wouldn't describe herself as lonely, as there were servants and aides to tend to her every need, but she couldn't help being happy to have friends over. So much so that she seemed to be exuding a subtle yet incredibly bouncy glow. With the celebration wrapping up around 5pm, and the return trip taking around half an hour, Izuku and Toru were, unfortunately, unable to go out for karaoke. They also lived in different directions. So, when Yairozu was preparing cabs for everyone to return, Izuku ended up sharing a ride with Achiko. She lived in a rent-free apartment provided by the school for low-income students, so she lived fairly close to the campus, only a single train stop away. As the cabs Yairozu rented were all luxury shuttles, black armor-plated limousines, Achiko was visibly nervous as she sat across from Izuku, awkwardly pointing out, I knew Yairozu Sen was super rich, but knowing something is quite a bit different from experiencing it directly. I, I never thought I'd have the chance to try caviar during a celebration with classmates. Hearing Achiko's comment, the thought of annulling her family's debts briefly appeared in Izuka's mind. However, as he had already decided to leave it to the principal, and because he didn't want Achiko to feel even more indebted to him, he quickly suppressed it, stating, It was quite the experience. Though, if I'm being honest, I would rather live in a medium-sized home with my family than some mansion. Unless they're a pro, no person needs a private tennis court. Regaining her usually bubbly smile, Achiko replied, I know, right? It all seems so extra. My goal, when I became a hero, was to ensure my family could live happily without worrying about money. But that... Just the house tour left me completely exhausted. Yeah, it was a little excessive, responded Izuko. Then, as Achiko had brought it up, he asked, Is your goal really just to provide for your family? If that's the case, you could probably make more money as an assistant researcher on I Island than a pro hero. Humanity may not be making any meaningful progress into space right now, 
But a quirk like yours would be a tremendous asset for testing equipment and conditioning astronauts for spacewalks. Blinking several times, Achiko's brain seemed to be working overtime for a few seconds before she rubbed the back of her head, an awkward smile returning to her face as she admitted, You know, I never even thought of that. Regaining a bit of her vigor, Achiko pumped her fist and added, Though, now that I've decided to become a hero, I intend to see it through to the end. Nodding in approval, a somewhat affectionate smile tinged Azuka's face as he said, That's great. Your power is super useful for helping people, and with adequate support items, you could easily become one of the top female heroes. Reverting to her awkward state, like there was some kind of switch for it in her mind, Achiko exhaled a nervous laugh, once again rubbing the back of her head as she said, Let's hope the agency that accepts me has those kinds of resources. Support items are pretty expensive, especially if you have them custom made. There's no denying that, said Izuku. However, I don't think you'll have any problems. If you befriend someone from the support department or become good friends with Yairosen, you're good to go. Though he was tempted to point out that she could also join the agency he intended to create. Izuku left that for a later date. Achiko was one of the girls crushing on him the hardest. So if he suddenly asked if she wanted to be a part of his future team, it would presumably become her entire motivation. In other words, if things didn't work out between them, it could derail her entire career. I would be lying if I said I hadn't thought about it. Admitted Achiko. I just don't think I could take advantage of someone's friendship like that. If Yairosen suddenly started gifting me expensive items or clothes, I think my brain might short circuit. I can totally see that, mused Izuku, exhaling a light chuckle as Achiko slightly puffed her cheeks. The latter had spent much of her life wanting nothing more than to ensure her family was happy and healthy. So money was more of a burden to her than something she genuinely desired. It just so happened that money was necessary to guarantee those two things. So, like most people living at or below the middle class line, Achiko had no choice but to pursue it. Shifting the conversation in a beneficial direction for both of them, Izuka suggested, How about this? Remember me mentioning having you help with the development of support items? If you help Meisan and me with developing new equipment, we can provide you the prototypes for field testing. I'm thinking of creating a trademark in the future, so you could even become the brand's poster girl. You're certainly cute enough. With Izuku reminding her of their conversation the previous day, Achiko's thoughts began to meander. She was listening to what he was saying, but her primary concern was the agreement they had made. When she looked up Mirko costumes online, even the cheapest one cost more than a million yen. Unless she settled for a cheap Halloween knockoff, she had no idea how she would afford one. You still with me, Achiko-san? asked Izuku, noticing the former's blank stare. Coming back to her senses, Achiko smiled awkwardly and replied, Yeah, sorry about that. izuku Quinn. I got a little distracted. But yeah, if you think I'll be able to help, I'd be happy to lend my assistance. I don't know much about engineering or support items, but I'll do my best. Witnessing Achiko regain her vigor for the umpteenth time, Izuka's smile softened into an appreciative look. He also had a good idea why her mind had wandered, so he surprised her by saying, I sent in the order for your Mirko outfit last night. I'm looking forward to seeing you try it on. Eh. Overcoming her initial confusion, Achiko's face began to turn red as she waved her hands in front of her and exclaimed, No, no, no. That wasn't a part of our agreement. I'm supposed to be rewarding you, not the other way around. Raising his brows, Izuka countered. Are you kidding me? I get to see a cute girl wear a bunny outfit in private. That's an opportunity some would pay an arm and a leg for. Preempting Achiko's response, Izuka added, Don't get too excited. To be honest, I actually bought multiple versions of the outfit since I didn't know which would fit you. If any of the other girls in our class are foolish enough to make a wager with me, I was planning to distribute them over time. Who knows, maybe a day will come when I get to see everyone in a bunny girl costume. Ha 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 ha, 
adopting a somewhat accusatory, pouty expression, Achiko narrowed her eyes at Izuko and asked, You really like Murko-san, don't you, izuka kuin Shrugging his shoulders, Izuko admitted, Well, she is my favorite pro-heroine. It would be significantly stranger if I didn't. Then if she offers you an internship, will you accept it? Asked Achiko. Since it wasn't something he could keep a secret, Izuku revealed. She has, and I already have. Blinking in surprise, Achiko needed a moment to process Izuku's words before asking. Wait, seriously? But isn't Mirko super famous for being a solo hero? As far as I'm aware, she doesn't even have an agency. How are you supposed to intern with her? Who knows? Answered Izuku. She approached me after the sports festival and asked if I wanted to intern with her. So I accepted without hesitation. As for what I'll be doing for the internship, she said she was going to show me the ropes of being a solo hero. With Izuku being the winner of the sports festival, Achiko wasn't too surprised to learn a hero had approached him directly. She did, however, feel a peculiar sense of urgency. She doubted anything would happen, but with Mirko being Izuka's favorite heroine, the chances weren't zero that something might. Catching Izuku a little off guard, Achiko abruptly asked, Do you mind if I sit next to you? Without actually waiting for Izuku to respond, Achiko moved from her seat and plopped down next to him with zero distance between them. There was space for up to five people on the long leather seat, but she elected to sit right next to him, a faint blush coloring her cheeks as she gazed up at him and asked, How soon until the costume arrives? Though he hadn't actually placed the order yet, Izuka confidently replied, It should arrive sometime tonight or tomorrow morning. Any competent support company had priority and overnight shipping, so if he forked over an additional fee, Izuku was certain they could get it to him within a few hours. Adopting a broad smile, Achiko said, Then it settled. Unless you have something better to do, bring them to school, and then we can go over to my place to try them on. I'm worried you'll think the costume looks dumb on me after you spend time with the actual Mirko, so this is the best time to try it out. Without hesitation, Izuku replied, Sounds good to me. But I am a little curious about something. Tilting her head to the side, Achiko asked, What is it? With an innocent look. Turning his face to meet Achiko's gaze completely, Izuka's smile gained a hint of playfulness as he asked, Did you really need to sit next to me to say this? Instead of answering Izuka's question, Achiko adopted an expression akin to an abandoned puppy as she asked, Can I not sit next to you? Shaking his head, Izuka's smile softened as he replied, On the contrary, I'm glad you did. Before holding out his left hand, palm side up. Achiko was a little confused by his actions at first. But after several seconds had passed, she blushingly linked her fingers through his for the remainder of the car ride, with his house being located on the campus. Izuku was able to take his time eating and preparing for his day before heading to class. Good morning, Yairza san said Izuku, finding the ever reliable class representative waiting for him when he arrived. Adopting her usual smile, Yairoza replied, Good morning to you as well, Izuku kun I trust you and Yurarika-san were able to return home without incident. Nodding his head, Izuko answered, For the most part, before adding, Thanks, by the way, both for the cab ride home and allowing us to use your home for the celebration. Shaking her head, Yairozu asserted, No need. Even if I weren't the class representative, I would have opened my home to everyone. Since I am, it was only natural to suggest hosting the party there. Offering a second nod, Izuku made a few more comments before he and Yairoza began preparing for homeroom. There wasn't much to do as they were returning from an extended break, but it never hurt to stay on top of things with morning classes passing without incident. Izuku was seated with the boys from his class, discussing the upcoming internships when Kaminari, as usual, changed the subject to the girls, remarking, Say, Midoriya Kuin, I noticed you sitting at the girls' table during the sports festival's lunch break. Seriously, man, how are you on such good terms with them? When Mineta and I asked if we could eat together, 
They practically chased us away. We've been over this, replied Izuku. I haven't done anything special to win them over, so there's nothing much I can say. As for you and Mineta Coin, your problem is that you're too eager and openly perverted. If it had anything to do with our looks, you'd be fairly popular. Come on, man. There has to be more to it than that, asserted Kaminari. You're clearly doing something right. So share your wisdom with the rest of us single dogs. With nearly everyone's attention focused on him, Izuku closed his eyes and exhaled a faint sigh before reasserting, I don't have any secrets, but if you want my advice on relationships, I can share it. Leaning forward with his elbows on the table, Kaminari remarked, Now we're talking. With great anticipation, resisting the urge to roll his eyes, Izuku explained, Any lasting, or, at the very least, meaningful relationship is built atop a foundation of friendship. As for the actual building blocks, a healthy relationship requires passion, shared interests, and security. If you only look at women and think, Man, she's cute. I really want to date her. You're already undermining yourself. While attraction is important, if you lack a shared interest or can't provide for one another's mental, physical, and emotional needs, the relationship is doomed to fail. Staring directly at Kaminari, Izuko added, Your problem is you only care about being in a relationship, not its quality. That, combined with the fact you act like a pervert, makes you seem unreliable and self-centered. Most girls seek partners that can provide for or support them emotionally. Keep thinking about your own wants and needs. And even if you get a girlfriend, they won't be with you long. Scratching his head, Kaminari's expression became somewhat awkward as he said, Damn, Midoriya Kuin, that's harsh. I appreciate the advice, but you don't hold back, do you? Shrugging his shoulders, Izuka replied, What did you expect? I mean, we are students of UA giving it our all, and then going even further beyond is kind of our whole shtick, plus ultra and all that. Before Kaminori could respond to his words, Izuko looked around the table adding, I'm not some love guru, but if you ever need my advice, feel free to ask. I can at least give it to you straight. Responding to Izuku's provocation, Mineta, with a somewhat resentful look on his face, said, it would be easier if you just told us what the girls liked. You spend so much time with them. You must know something that could be useful to the rest of us. Resisting the urge to tell Mineta to shoo off, Izuku just shook his head, maintaining a relaxed smile as he replied, Learning about the person you like and getting to know them personally is part of becoming friends with them. If you stop staring at the girls as objects of desire and start treating them as potential friends, everything becomes much easier. Deciding he had had enough of talking about the girls, Izuku shifted his attention to Tokoyami saying, Anyways, tokoyami Kuen, you said you got a referral from the number three hero, Hawks, right? That's awesome, man. Based on what I heard, Hawks is one of the most efficient heroes in the biz. He rarely leaves his patrol area, but things are super peaceful there thanks to his presence. Nodding his crow-like head, Tokoyami replied, Indeed. I was honestly a little surprised since I suffered such a crushing defeat in the tournament. I just hope I'll be able to live up to his expectations. Returning a nod of his own, Izuku asserted, You'll be fine. Your quirk is one of the most versatile in the entire class. Just being able to fly gives you a massive advantage over most people. So once you master wearing your dark shadow as a veil, you'll become a lot stronger. I appreciate the vote of confidence, replied Tokoyami, his beak forming a smile as he added. If you had not encouraged me to delve deeper into the abyss, I might never have realized my full potential. Waving his hand in front of his face, Izuku refuted Tokoyami's words, assuring him he would have reached a similar conclusion in time. Then, as was often the case when he spent time with the boys in his class, Izuku passed the lunch break, talking about how each of them, himself included, could improve. With the bell ringing to announce the start of afternoon classes, Aizawa arrived in the classroom with his usual deadpan expression and haggard appearance. Everyone fell silent as he entered, remaining that way until he reached the podium at the front of the room revealing, there will be no training this afternoon. 
Instead, in preparation for your internships, you will be choosing hero names. Hearing that they would finally be choosing their hero names, everyone in the class became excited. Well, almost everyone. Izuku still hadn't come up with a hero name he was satisfied with, so his enthusiasm was lacking compared to his classmates. Fortunately, he knew what came next, so the smile on his face was genuine. Shortly after Aizawa showed the breakdown of everyone's intern referrals and began discussing the importance of picking a proper hero name, the door to the classroom slid open, followed by the appearance of midnight shouting. Because if you fail to pick a proper name, it'll be hell from then on. Contrasting the excitement of the other boys in class, Izuku maintained a faint smile, sitting contentedly at his desk in the back of the room until he noticed Midnight looking directly at him. It was only for a brief moment, but he was certain their gazes had met before the buxom. Raven-haired heroine took over at the front of the class explaining, Your hero name is effectively your brand. It's what people all across the world will come to know you as. So choosing a name that reflects your heroic principles is of paramount importance. Fail to pick a proper one, or have your name given to you by the public, and it could haunt you your entire career. Nodding his head, Aizawa added, The way your futures end up depends heavily on your hero names. As they say, names and natures often agree. All Might is a good example of this, as his name not only reflects strength, but it's also a play on the phrase, Everything is going to be alright thus giving rise to his most iconic catchphrase. Taking over for Aizawa, Midnight raised her hand and enthusiastically exclaimed, Everything will be all right. Why, you ask? Because All Might is here, though All Might was not, in fact, present. Nearly everyone in the class clapped in response to Midnight's outburst. Shortly after, Aizawa left the classroom leaving the R-rated heroine in charge of helping the students pick their hero names. With classes letting out much earlier than usual, Izuku politely refused an invitation from Ojiro and Shoji to hit the gym. He would have liked to, but he already had a prior engagement. Thus, when everyone began to head home, he pretended to do the same, accompanying Tsuyu and Achiko to the station. Then, after seeing Tsuyu off, Izuku and Achiko boarded a train together, making their way to the latter's apartment, a fairly simple dwelling with a single bedroom and a bath. Rubbing the back of her head, Achiko, appearing very nervous, said, Sorry if it's a bit cramped. I also don't have much furniture, but you can sit on my bed if you'd like. Making Achiko even more embarrassed, Izuka took a whiff of the air and remarked, It smells like you, before providing a bit of relief as he added, it's a very pleasant aroma. Exhaling a sigh, Achiko patted her chest a few times before doing her best to perk up as she asked. So, did you bring them? You didn't forget them at school, did you? Of course not, replied Izuko, removing his backpack and opening it to reveal several vacuum-sealed packages. Achiko's face paled when she noticed they were from the company that produced Mirko's actual hero costume, but she did her best not to panic, snatching Izuka's backpack as she stammered, Jay, just give me a moment, before rushing into the bathroom. As the costumes he had purchased were around 9 million yen apiece, Izuka wasn't even remotely surprised by Achiko's reaction. He could have bought a much cheaper variety, but he believed it might receive some additional benefits if he got his hands on the real deal. He might not want Achiko to feel indebted to him but feelings of appreciation were always welcome. While Achiko was busy getting changed, Izuku resisted the urge to look around her room and settled on her bed. However, instead of sitting, he shamelessly laid down, placing his hands behind his head and closing his eyes in preparation for a short nap. When he heard the shower turn on a few minutes later, that was precisely what he did. After all, it would be at least half an hour before Achiko got changed, and mustered the courage to come outside. Rousing Izuku from his slumber, the timid voice of Achiko called out, I, Izuku-kun, in a hesitant tone. Hmm. Opening his eyes, Izuku was tempted to feign ignorance and pretend like he didn't know what was going on, but he immediately changed his mind when he saw Achiko. He had expected her 
to look good in Mirko's outfit. After all, it was a very well-designed hero garb. However, while that was certainly the case, it was more accurate to say she was adorable, almost unreasonably. So, seeing the stunned look on Nezuka's face, some of Achiko's nervousness began to fade away, allowing her to smile bashfully as she said, Sorry for taking so long. My, my body was a bit sweaty due to nerves, so I decided to take a quick shower before getting changed. Blushing at the admission of her nervousness, Achiko promptly decided to change topics, stammering, Hey anyways, how do I look? I don't think it suits me that well, but, well, since it's your reward, I guess it only matters what you think. Izuka Koen. As Izuku was still in an open-mouthed stupor, Achiko began to get a little worried. Fortunately, repeating his name was enough to break the spell he was under, prompting him to express, You look amazing, with the most sincere, wide-eyed look he could manage. Then, as important things were best repeated, he added, Like, really, really amazing, it's almost ridiculous. Not expecting such heavy praise, Achiko's face became redder each time Izuku called her amazing. She was still super embarrassed to be wearing such a tight and revealing costume, but she was happy to have gone through with it. It made what came next much easier. So, what now? asked Achiko. I put it on, but it doesn't feel like much of a reward if that's all I do. Should I do some poses or something? Shaking his head, Izuku answered. The terms of our wager were that you wore it. That's it. If I start making additional requests, I'd be overstepping my bounds. Adopting a faint smile, Izuka added. Though, if you want to pose, I'm certainly not going to close my eyes and look away. Rather, I doubt I'd be able to take my eyes off you. I see, replied Achiko, pressing the tips of her fingers together, as she often did when she was nervous. To then, how about this? asked Achiko, striking a cutesy pose with her hands held to resemble the ears of a rabbit. The outfit included a bunny-eared headband, but that didn't mean her actions were any less cute. Instead of saying anything, Izuku just smiled and observed Achiko with interest. He suspected she had ulterior motives behind inviting him to her apartment, but as he had made it clear he wasn't looking for a committed relationship, he wasn't entirely sure what she was thinking. He doubted she had the same nature as Toro. But there was a saying that the quieter a girl was in public, the louder she was in the bedroom. Seeing Izuku just staring at her from her bed, lying on it as if it belonged to him, Achiko's nervousness slowly gave way to frustration. She wasn't sure how she wanted things to develop, but she thought Izuku would be a little more aggressive. She had even prepared herself for some rather risque requests, including light petting, but it was starting to look like he had no intention of doing anything but observing. After failing to get a rise, even after striking a pose that showed off her, but, and the tiny white tail above it, Achiko surprised Izuka by stamping her foot and exclaiming, at least say something, feigning that he was blinking black to awareness. An awkward smile adorned Izuka's face as he sat up, rubbing the back of his head as he excused, sorry Achiko-san, I was so taken by how adorable you were that my brain kind of shut off. Oh, oh, I see, replied Achiko, regaining a bit of her earlier timidity as a somewhat silly smile developed across her face. She still felt vexed, but no girl hated being called cute, at least not when it was coming from the boy they liked. Mustering some courage, Achiko met Izuka's gaze with slightly upturned eyes as she said, still, it feels weird if I stand here and pose while you lie down and watch. If you'd like, we can try other things. Without explaining what she meant, Achiko made her way over to the bed and sat down, her back and exposed shoulders facing Izuku. Then, after a moment of extreme tension, she looked over her shoulder with a fierce red face and said, I could! I could try acting like your pet rabbit, in a faint, nearly inaudible tone. As he was genuinely too dazed to respond, Izuku and Achiko just stared at each other for several seconds before the latter, seeming interpreting his silence as consent, abruptly laid back across his lap, 
staring up at him as she said, Pet me, in a faint but resolute tone. Without any discernible hesitation, Izuku extended his left hand to caress Achiko's head, eliciting a narrow-eyed smile as he did so. She seemed to really enjoy having her hair stroked, but after a minute or two passed, she opened her eyes and softly asserted, You don't have to focus on just my head, you know. Since the alternatives were Achiko's cheeks and everything below, Izuka hesitated for a split second before placing his right hand on her stomach. Achiko's body tensed as he did so. But instead of saying he had crossed the line, she closed her eyes and regained her smile. While gently stroking Achiko's hair and surprisingly toned abdomen, Izuka thought to himself, I think I'm starting to understand what kind of girl Achiko is. She clearly enjoys being pampered, so the real question is, is she also the type that will use this as an excuse to return the favor? It sure seems like something she'd do. Feeling a little emboldened, Izuka moved his hand further up Achiko's abdomen, his thumb and wrist grazing her boobs as he massaged her diaphragm. Her body tensed as he did so, but she didn't seem to mind it. Rather, with her eyes closed, face beat red, and a somewhat forced smile, she eventually said, It's okay if you touch them. Since the only other things Achiko had two of were eyes, ears, hands, and feet, Izuka knew she was talking about her melons. Thus, after a brief moment of feigned hesitation, he gently cupped Achiko's left boob, remarking, It's soft, as if it were his first time doing so. While keeping her eyes closed, Achiko exhaled an awkward ihi type laugh. She was clearly very embarrassed, but much more than that, she didn't want things to end. After all, the further they went now, the easier many things would be in the future. With Achiko effectively allowing him to do as he pleased, Izuka bounced, jiggled, and gave each of her melons a few light squeezes. Unfortunately, as the material used to make heroin outfits were incredibly durable and high-end, he couldn't make out her nipples through the fabric. He had a pretty good idea of where they were based on Achiko's reactions, but he would have liked to tease them directly. After several minutes of apparent fumbling around, Achiko opened her eyes to reveal a faint glaze covered each of them, asking, Do you like my melons, izuka Kuin?" Without hesitation, Izuku answered, Absolutely. They have a borderline addictive softness, and I can feel your heartbeat through them. Thanks for letting me touch them, by the way. I held out some hope that I might be able to, but I never thought you'd actually let me. Blinking in surprise, Achiko asked, Oh, you mean you wanted to touch my melons? Smiling wryly, Izuka replied, I mean, yeah, I am a guy after all. It would be stranger if I didn't want to touch them. Piggybacking off of Izuka's words, Achiko steeled herself as she asked, then there must be other things you want to touch, right? You are a boy, after all. I'm sure you have a similar interest in butts and thighs. Instead of denying it, Izuka maintained his smile as he remarked, Well, Mirko is my favorite heroine. Though she didn't appreciate Izuka suddenly mentioning Mirko's name, Achiko chose to ignore it as she sat up, suggesting, Then, how about a change in position? I could try sitting in your lap, or I could use my quirk, and we could try cuddling in the air. The latter sounds incredibly interesting, admitted Izuku. However, if we take things any further, I'm not sure I'd be able to hold myself back. Seeing Izuku look away from her, staring at something in his lap, Achiko eventually followed his gaze. When she noticed what he was staring at, her already red face became crimson as she internally exclaimed, is that what that was? While recalling the feeling of something hard against her back. That's how it is, said Izuku. I mean, you're a beautiful girl, Achiko-san. Donning that outfit and letting me touch your melons. It would be weirder if I didn't have a reaction. As she wasn't exactly calm herself, Achiko didn't condemn Izuku or accuse him of being a pervert. Instead, she cupped her crimson cheeks roughly massaging them with a strange, V-shaped smile on her face. It might have been indirectly, but the notion she had touched a boy's meat grinder was making her brain go crazy. Seeing Achiko abruptly start floating, 
Seemingly unaware that she had activated her quirk, Hizuka's expression softened. The one thing he was still getting used to in his new life was how animated everyone was. He did his best to behave in a similar manner, but doing so made him cringe or caused him to suffer other forms of mental damage. Still, at times like this, he greatly appreciated that he had been transmigrated to a world of anime. Coming to her senses after bumping into her ceiling, Achiko muttered, What? When did I activate my quirk? Before turning herself upright and negating its effects. Fortunately, when she looked over to Izuku, he didn't seem to mind. Instead, he had a gentle, what Achiko convinced herself was a loving smile on his face. At the very least, it compelled her heart to skip a beat. Seemingly out of nowhere, Achiko surprised both Izuku and herself by asking, If you had the opportunity to sleep with Murko-san during your internship, would you do it? Though he was caught off guard by the question, causing his smile to disappear, Izuku only hesitated for a moment before responding, More than likely. I mentioned this to Mina in the past, but I have a preference for passionate women who know what they want. That's the true reason Mirko is my favorite heroine. I'm more reserved, but she and I have very similar natures. Disregarding most of what Izuko had said, Achiko moved closer to the bed, her expression gaining a certain allure as she asked. So, as long as a girl knows what they want, you're okay with them? It's not that simple, replied Izuko, adding, Truth be told, I consider myself a hypocrite. I'm fiercely loyal when I'm in a committed relationship, but when I'm not, I'm more like a hungry wolf. The only reason I don't act on my feelings is that, more than anything else, I hate hurting the people around me, especially those I care about. Though she got the impression Izuku was trying to warn her, Achiko sat down on the edge of the bed, holding his gaze without saying anything. Her female intuition told her that something would happen when Izuku left for his internship. Izuku had a way of seating himself in the heart of every girl he interacted with. So if he and Mikro were left alone together, Achiko was certain a line would be crossed. That's why, moving her hand closer to Izuka's, Achiko had a look that made it very clear she wasn't joking as she asked, Izuka Kuin, do you want to shaboink with me? Feeling his throat tense, Izuka carefully considered his response before admitting, I would be lying if I said I didn't. Gaining a faint smile, Achiko left Izuka even more speechless as her fingers grazed his, accompanied by the question, And what about Tsuyu, Mina, and the others? Do you want to shaboink with them as well? If this were his previous world, Izuku would have been certain he was walking into a trap. Instead, his mind raced to piece together a response that wouldn't make him look like a complete and utter scumbag. Without waiting for Izuku's response, Achiko's smile softened as she said, It's okay. You don't have to lie or force yourself to try and come up with an excuse. I think most of the girls understand you aren't looking for a normal high school romance. As strange as it sounds, that may be why we're so attracted to you. You're so mature, and you almost always tell us exactly how you feel. It's reassuring. I feel like if I entrusted you with my everything, you take care of me for the rest of my life. Regaining her serious expression, Achiko's voice was nearly a shout as she said, That's why it's okay. Izuka Kuin, if you really, really, really want to shaboink with me, I think we should just go ahead and do it. That way, I won't have any regrets. Even when I see you with another girl. Though he was tempted to ask how exactly, shaboinking would leave her without regrets. Izuka's mind wasn't in the condition to ask questions, or make witty remarks. All he could think was, is this really the world of my hero academia, or did I transmigrate into an eroge? Regaining his senses just as it looked like Achiko was about to pounce. Izuku lied through his teeth stating, I didn't bring any protection. Even if the chances of you getting pregnant are slim, we shouldn't be shaboinking without protection. It only takes one mishap to drastically alter the course of our lives. Hearing Izuka's very convincing argument, Achiko's enthusiasm began to settle, an awkward smile developing across her face as she admitted, I may have gotten a little ahead of myself, 
At the very least, I don't think I'm ready to be a mom, not yet. Internally sighing in relief, Izuka gained a genuine smile as he said, I do want to shaboink with you though, just not right now. I mean, we've only known each other for around a month. Rushing into things, even if it feels right, isn't a good idea. Raising her brows, Achiko asked, But didn't you say you were willing to shaboink with Murko-san during your internship? Even if it happens on the last day, you'll only have known each other for a week. Exhaling through his nose, Izuka's expression softened as he explained, I get what you're saying, but you, our situation isn't the same as Murko's. She's a mature woman and has been a pro hero for nearly a decade. Even if we cross the line, it likely wouldn't have a significant effect on her life or career. That isn't the case for you, us. We're still in high school and will probably be in the same class until graduation. Our decisions will impact how we treat and interact with one another for the rest of our academic careers, if not much longer. Adopting a narrow-eyed smile, Achiko pointed out, See, this is exactly what I was talking about before. You're way more mature than other boys, Izuka Koen. Even when you're backed into a corner, you never lose control and constantly think about the well-being of others. You may be a wolf at heart, but you have a strong pack mentality. Unable to refute Achiko's words, Izuku remained completely silent. As a result, Achiko felt encouraged to suggest. Then, short of shadow inking, can we try everything that comes before? I know you're not looking for a girlfriend right now, but I really like you, Izuka Kuen. It might be unfair to the other girls in our class, but I'd like to get ahead of them just a bit. Nodding his head, Izuku replied, Sure, but we should still take it slow. As I mentioned before, I wouldn't be able to restrain myself if I got too riled up. For now, we should focus on things like smooching and holding hands. If you want to do something more intimate, we could cuddle and explore each other's bodies. I certainly wouldn't mind getting my hands on your melons again. Then let's do that, replied Achiko. A happy smile plastered across her face. Now that she knew she and Izuka weren't going to shaboink, she felt strangely relieved. There were a few other emotions she couldn't fully describe, but she wasn't disappointed with how things developed. Rather, knowing Izuku could retain his reasoning, even when he had no reason to, Achiko felt she could trust him even more. Thus, when Izuku invited her to sit on his lap, resulting in something warm and very, very hard pressing against her, but Achiko just closed her eyes and entrusted her body to his care, relaxing her body and allowing Izuka to grope her chest as much as he pleased. After apologizing to his mom for his late return, Izuku plopped face first into his bed, mentally exhausted. He couldn't believe he had blue-balled himself, but seeing the earnestness in Achiko's gaze, he couldn't help but hesitate. A girl like her deserved a man who would pamper and take care of her every need, not some opportunistic bastard who only cared about getting his meat grinder wet. Maybe I should just drop out of the hero program and focus exclusively on developing one for all. I'm sure I could convince Tashinori and Nizuitz for the best once all for one reveals himself. Though he didn't regret casting a wide net at the start of the school year, Izuka hadn't expected it to catch virtually every girl in his class. One or two he could handle. But having six different girls pining after him was a possibility he didn't consider. It didn't help that they were strangely okay with him targeting all of them. Hell, Mina and Toru were actively trying to help him woo the other girls, not to mention Tashinori. This really might be a world based on an eroge, thought Izuku. It would explain why the goddess of reincarnation allowed me to select a system. I mean, it's not like I had any particular interest in the genre. If I did, I would have gone with something OP from the start. Presuming his speculation to be accurate, as it was the only thing that made sense, Izuku began organizing his thoughts around that possibility. Back when Mina had asked him if he was aiming for a harem, Izuku was being honest when he said it was a childish notion. He also didn't believe in two-timing, but if, on the off chance, multiple girls approached him with the idea of sharing, he wouldn't exactly be against it. At the very least, 
He didn't think a threesome was outside the realm of possibility. What the hell am I even thinking? Groaned Izuku, albeit internally. At this rate, I'll become the very thing I hate. A piece of trash who only sees women as outlets for shabo inking. If that's the case, I should just put a bullet between my brain right now. Seriously considering the notion, at least for 10 to 20 seconds, Izuku eventually banished the thought. He may not value his own life, but there were a lot of people who did. There was also the fact he had taken on the burden of one for all. If he simply offed himself millions, if not billions, of people would suffer as a result of his selfishness. Not to mention that his mother, Inko, would be completely devastated. Recalling the time when he had given Inko a massage, the notion that he was in an eroge became firmly cemented in Azuka's mind. Inko may have been exceptionally lonely, but making a pass at her son wasn't normal. If he had crossed the line at that moment, the two of them would probably be shadow inking right this instant. In the worst case scenario, he may have even gotten her pregnant, transforming an exceptionally kind and caring woman into a deviant whose body and womb had been befouled by her own son. Feeling sick, Izuku decided to head outside for some fresh air or cool his head in his workshop. The moment he stepped out of his room, the sound of a shower running tickled his ears, drawing his attention to his mother's bedroom door, opened just enough to let out a thin beam into the otherwise dark corridor. Someone is definitely messing with me, thought Izuku, shifting his gaze to the ceiling and imagining himself looking through it to a realm far above the skies. What he didn't know was, at the same time, thousands of eyes were staring back at him, some with intrigue, and others with quite a bit of resentment. One, in particular, had a paradoxically kind yet sadistic grin on her face. In preparation for their internships, the students of class 1A returned to their foundational hero training in earnest. This included rescue training at USJ, urban environment training at Field Beta, anti-terrorism training at the industrial complex of Field Gamma, and search and rescue training in the forests of Field Omega. Though he did his best to focus on his training, making several excuses to avoid spending too much time with the girls, Izuka felt he was becoming closer with each of them. They would almost always be teamed up during foundational heroics classes, and if they weren't, he would often have to rescue them when they got into trouble. Fortunately, though Achiko and Toru seemed determined to claim his V-card, Izuku had yet to fall prey to their wiles. Achiko, even when shabowinkingly charged, was a fairly passive girl that liked to give as she received. Toru, on the other hand, had all the qualities of a developing nymph. Whenever the two met up, Izuku would invariably be depleted by a combination of her hands, mouth, and thighs. It was an exceptional form of stress relief, but the more he fed into Toru's desires, the more emboldened she became. Keep going, moaned Toru, her invisible face flushed up to her ears. I'm so close. While most other students had gone home for the day, Izuku and Toru had occupied a bathroom stall in the boys' restroom. The latter had her hands and racks pressed up against the stall door, while Izuku, making sure no accidents occurred, schmucked her intercruelly from behind. It was easily the furthest they had gone. But Toru wanted more, waiting until she was near her limit, before slipping her invisible hand between her thighs. For the first time, Izuku indulged himself further. Giving in to the wiles of the lovely girl before him, he let himself go, popping her cherry in an intense schmucking session. They had nearly broken the stall walls as he drilled her from behind, but this had led to an interesting development. Bond threshold has been reached. Would you like to add Toru Hagakure to your party? Nen. Toru Hagakure. Quirk. Invisibility. Bond level. 83. Current level. 20. Effective level. 28. Attributes. Strength. 29. Agility. 35. Vitality. 58. Intelligence. 51. Dexterity, 41. Luck, 68. Free attributes, 100. Perks, party invitation required. After seeing Toru to her home, returning to his own, washing up, 
and changing into a dry-cleaned uniform, Izuku immediately made his way toward the principal's office. He had promised to keep Nizu apprised of any developments related to his quirk, so he suppressed his discomfort and did just that. Leaving out the finer details of the events, Izuku explained how a status screen had popped up when he was shabowinking, including the fact a new attribute had appeared alongside the apparent option to allocate the free attributes of his partner. Though he was more than a little surprised to hear Izuku's report, Nizu appeared calm and composed throughout the explanation. When it was finally over, the diminutive cat bear mouse remarked, what a peculiar development. To think your quirk would allow you to quantify a person's feelings and increase their attributes, that alone would have been truly remarkable. The power to grant your partner perks is extraordinary to the point of terrifying. Before Izuku could ask, Nizu went on to explain, I went back through the records of nearly every student that has attended UA, and there were quite a few with quirks comparable to your perks. In other words, each of your perks is like a pseudo quirk. If you can grant such abilities to others, it's no different from providing them additional quirks. Just to be safe, Nizu furrowed his brows and asked, You haven't already distributed this mystery girl's attributes and granted her perks, have you? Shaking his head, Izuku replied, Of course not. I wouldn't do such a thing without properly understanding the ramifications. That's why I came here to report to you. Breathing a sigh of relief, Nizu remarked, That was a wise decision. If your abilities were somehow disclosed to the public, I can't imagine how many people would lobby to have your quirk properly analyzed. After all, at its core, it's an ability that could mass-produce geniuses and bestow quirks onto others, potentially even those without. As similar thoughts had already crossed his mind, Izuku just gave a curt nod in response to Niza's grim statement. He knew better than most how effective even a moderate boost to intelligence was. If he boosted Toru's from 51 to 151, she would go from fairly average to one of the smartest people in the world. After all, even May, a genuine prodigy, only had 149, lightening the mood a little bit. Nizu adopted a smile and said, Still, I'm not going to prohibit you from using a power you were born with. So long as you have the other person's consent, it's fine to experiment a bit. Just keep a proper record and inform me if there are any crucial or concerning developments. I will do my best to help you resolve them. Returning a smile of his own, Izuku replied, Thank you, Principal Nizu. Knowing I have your support makes all of this a lot easier. I promise not to use my power carelessly. Exhaling a light chuckle, Nizu surprised Izuku by saying, It's fine to be a little careless. You're young, after all. Society will be far harsher to you as an adult, so feel free to make all the mistakes you want while you can still get away with them. I certainly wouldn't mind having a few extra geniuses around the campus. Once again feeling as though he was in an eroge, Izuka's smile gained a hint of wryness as he replied, I'll do my best to keep things moderate. Nodding his head, knees amused. It's certainly the wisest course of action. Now, unless you have something else to report, I will let you be on your way. Make sure to get plenty of rest before your internship. Yusuji Yamasan is a somewhat brash, violence-prone woman. If she threatens or harms you in any way, do not hesitate to leave or give me a call. Returning a nod of his own, Izuka thanked Nizu for his concern before departing for his home. What he didn't know was that shortly after his departure, a fairly tall woman with raven black hair and piercing blue eyes was called into the principal's office for a discussion about implementing a Shiboinked class for the first years, particularly the girls, as Okinoshima was nearly four hours away from Mizutofu via train and ferry. Izuka woke up around 2 a.m., catching one of the earliest possible trains to ensure he would be there as early as possible. Though it was embarrassing to admit, Izuku was looking forward to his internship with Mirko more than ever before. The reassurance given to him by the principal helped alleviate many of his concerns. Now, even if he did inadvertently knock up one of the girls, 
he didn't think it would be too big an issue. Rather, his mother would probably be delighted to have a grandchild or two to look after. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku eventually found himself aboard a ferry at Tadanami Port. He originally intended to try and jump over directly, but the distance was nearly 4 kilometers. He could propel himself through the air with shockwaves, but if he missed the timing and crash-landed in the forest, a few broken bones would be the least of his concerns. Fortunately, while Mirko lived alone on Okinoshima, the ferry leading to the island could be taken at any time, so long as you had permission to be there. Okinoshima Rabbit Island, as its name suggested, was a former animal sanctuary that used to house more than 5,000 rabbits before being razed to the ground during the previous war. The forests and shrines had returned since then, but the native rabbit population had diminished considerably. Izuku found it amusing that Mirko, the rabbit hero, had made the island her home, but he couldn't deny it suited her. After reaching the shore of Okinoshima, Izuku asked the ferry captain if he knew where Mirko's residence was. Unfortunately, she was a recluse when she wasn't out fighting crime, so the only people who knew where she lived were those who had been there. As a result, Izuku was left with no choice but to scour the island himself. Fortunately, it was only 4.3 kilometers across at its widest point and had a surface area of around 7,000 meters squared. The uneven terrain and forest made navigation marginally more difficult. But even a normal person could search the entire island in just a few hours. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku waited for the ferry to depart before stepping onto the path leading up to an old shrine. Before he even made it a few steps, however, a sound similar to a thundercrack reached his ears, followed by the hair on the back of his neck standing on end. Leaping to the side, Izuku barely managed to avoid a meteoric strike from his petite yet exceptionally powerful assailant. Rising from the crater she had created, Mirko swept aside the bangs on the right side of her face, her expression a massive grin as she said, Nice dodge, kid! Awareness of one's surroundings is one of the most important things for a solo hero. Flexing the muscles in her thighs with enough force to push away the loose sand and gravel around her feet, Mirko added. But the absolute most important thing for any hero to possess is raw power. Since you dared to accept my internship, your only options are to fight or run. Try the latter, and I'll chase your sorry, but all the way back to Mizutafu. Without waiting for Izuka's response, Mirko charged toward him like a chocolate-colored lightning bolt. Her agility had abruptly shot up to more than triple its base, but thanks to Izuka's inordinately high dex, boosted further by the power of one for all, he wasn't incapable of following her movements. Keeping up with them, however, would require a multiplier of 150, something he could only maintain for a few seconds. Leaping back as fast as he could, Izuku attempted to dissuade Mirko's charge by expelling dozens of black whip tendrils from his body. Instead of being deterred, however, Mirko twisted her body like a bow, almost as though her bones themselves were flexible, before kicking at the tendrils directly. As she did so, a powerful shockwave generated outward, tearing through most of the tendrils as she shouted, Luna Whip! This is going to hurt, thought Izuku, even as he temporarily boosted his agility to more than 2,000. Mirko's initial three times boost had been the result of her holding back, so after seeing he could keep up with her, her agility increased to a monstrous 5,800. As a result, Izuku could only grit his teeth, lamenting the fact he hadn't invested enough attributes into strength to unlock the bronze skin perk as Mirko began to hammer him with rapid-fire blows, screaming, Luna Rush, with an almost feral smile on her face. Waking to an unfamiliar bamboo ceiling, Izuku remained completely motionless for a while as he inspected the condition of his status and body. Name. Izuka Midoriya. Quirk. Digitalization Transfer Stockpiling Singularity Gear Shift Sealed. Far Gene Sealed. Danger Sense Sealed. Black Whip. Smokescreen Sealed. Float sealed. Current level, 27, 849,008 EXP. Effective level, 39, 
Attributes Strength 10 to 6 Agility 10 to 4 Vitality 100 to 41 Intelligence 100 to 88 Dexterity 100 to 38 Luck 75 Free Attributes 0 Rerolls available 2 Perks Lesser Regeneration Healthy Body Sharp Mind Eidetic Memory Nimble Fingers Keen Senses Lucky That woman doesn't know the meaning of the word restraint Thought Izuku, even knowing Mirko must, have been holding back to avoid killing him outright. He didn't think he had broken anything, but every muscle in his body ached, and he had a concussion-induced headache for the first time since his transmigration. Ignoring the pain in his body as best he could, Izuku rose to a seated position to get a better look at his surroundings. The room he was in was pretty bare-bones, the only notable piece of furniture being the futon he was sleeping on. As for its actual appearance, it looked like a traditional Japanese room, primarily comprised of wood and bamboo, complete with sliding bamboo doors and tatama mat flooring. Is this a shrine or something? Pondered Izuku, not expecting Mirko to live in such a simple dwelling. She might not give off a modern or trendy vibe, but it was difficult to associate the word traditional with a woman who went around beating the crap out of people. Rising to his feet, Izuka slid open the nearest bamboo door, leading to a dark hallway with a wooden floor with very little lighting. He didn't know how long he had been out, but it was long enough that he felt hungry and seriously needed to take a crap. Setting out in search of a bathroom, Izuka didn't get very far when Mirko, having heard him stir thanks to her incredible hearing, emerged from the opposite end of the hallway remarking, You recover pretty quickly. After that last blow to the head, I expected you to be out the entire day. I was even thinking of taking you to the hospital. Resisting the urge to say that is precisely what she should have done, Izuka weakly shook his head and asserted, I just need to rest for a few hours, and I should be fine. Right now though, I seriously need to use the bathroom. Mind telling me where it is? Ah, I was wondering why you were skulking about all quiet-like, remarked Mirko. Then, thumbing over her shoulder, she added, It's this way. I'll show you where it's at, and then give you a quick tour. After that, I imagine you're pretty hungry, right? Food's in the kitchen. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, Mirko turned around and began walking away. This time, however, Izuka's gaze lowered a bit his eyes drinking in the sight of the bunny girl's beautifully toned, but in her hero costume, name. Rumi Yusujiyama. Quirk Rabbit. Bond Level. 31. Current Level. 83. Effective Level. 219 Attribute Strength. 388 Agility. 442 Vitality. 647 Intelligence. 39. Dexterity. 460. Luck. 219. Free Attributes. 415. Perks. Uh, party Invitation Required. Hmm. As the only status he had checked since Toru's was his own, Izuku was surprised to find he could see the bond between him and Mirko. He didn't know if 31 was good or not, but it would be useful if he intended to make a pass at the unreasonably powerful woman. The real question was, with the Perks tab mentioning a party, did that mean he could invite Mirko right then and there? Seemingly responding to his thoughts, a notification message displaying target's bond level is not high enough for party invite appeared before Izuka's eyes. Fortunately, even though it was super bright from his point of view, it cast no light on his face or surroundings. After taking a rather tense dumb, lamenting that Mirko could probably hear each of his bowel movements, Izuku was given a quick tour of her traditional Shinden Zakuri style house. There were few features, as Mirko didn't seem to care about such things, but it had a central courtyard filled with carrot patches, an onsen-like bath, and a fairly modern training gym. When Izuku eyed the carrot patches with raised brows, Mirko made it a point to note, they're not for me, brat. I keep a few rabbits in my room and sometimes let them out when I have a day off. Raising his brows even further, Izuku asked, You keep pet rabbits? Furrowing her own, 
Mirko's voice was especially husky as she asked, You got a problem with that? Why would I? Asked Izuku, adding, Rabbits are my favorite animal. They're small, relatively low maintenance, and extremely cute. If I were allowed to keep one, I would. Ho, oh, hummed Mirko. Are you trying to flatter me, brat? If they're really your favorite animal, you should at least know the scientific name for them, right? Snorting through his nose, Izuku defiantly remarked, Too easy. Their scientific name is Orctologus cuniculus. However, even if rabbits are their favorite animals, most people wouldn't know that. I just happen to be well-educated. Yeah, yeah, said Mirko, waving her hand dismissively before adding, Work hard these next couple of days, and I might let you see and pet them. For now, let's get some grub. Guiding Izuku to the kitchen and attached dining room, Mirko surprised him by presenting a variety of well-prepared, highly nutritious dishes. There weren't any meat dishes, but there were braised tofu, red beans, brussels sprouts, and sautéed mushrooms among the many vegetarian dishes. You're too easily surprised, remarked Mirko. I live alone out here, so it's only natural that I can cook. Besides, you can't cultivate strong muscles if you're lacking in nutrition. Size doesn't mean crap over quality. Punctuating her words with a slap to her thigh, Mirko sat across from Izuku at the low-lying table, requiring them to sit on cushions rather than proper chairs. She had already eaten, but Mirko wanted to ask Izuku a few questions, and though she would never admit it, she was interested in hearing what he had to say about her cuisine. Seeing Izuku just staring at her, Mirko furrowed her brows and asked, What are you waiting for, permission? Start eating, and then answer my questions while you do. Picking up the provided chopsticks, Izuku began to engorge himself on the prepared dishes. His vitality recovered much quicker when he had a full stomach, so he was like a ravenous hyena with only marginally better table manners. Nodding her head in approval, Mirko asserted, Good. A strong appetite is a sign of good health. Now on to my first question, and I expect you to be honest with me. Swallowing the food in his mouth, Izuku replied, Go for it. Before Mirko could ask her question, narrowing her eyes slightly, Mirko asked, Why did you choose to intern with me? And don't give me some bullcrap about it being because I asked you to. If I hadn't received that email from the principal, I wouldn't have known you existed. Even someone like me can understand he contacted me on your behalf. Instead of feigning surprise, Izuka nodded a few times, remarking, That sounds like something he'd do. As for why, well... The most straightforward way to explain it is that I'm one of the people All Might thinks would make a good successor as the symbol of peace. He and the principal are really close, so I've been receiving a ton of their support in secret. Raising her brows, Mirko asked, If it's such a secret, why are you running your mouth? Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku casually replied, You're the top-ranked pro-heroine and not much older than me. You're part of the generation that should have been the most affected by All Might's rise, so I doubt you'd do anything to undermine him. Besides, you told me to be honest. If I tried lying, my instincts tell me I would suffer quite a bit. Adopting a somewhat lazy posture with her cheek resting on the knuckles of her right hand, Mirko muttered, Well, you're not wrong. Both about me being a fan of All Might and me being prepared to beat the crap out of you if you tried lying. Narrowing her eyes, Mirko added, Anyways, you being one of All Might's protégés doesn't answer my question. Why did you come here? I think that's pretty obvious, replied Izuku, scooping up a few mouthfuls of rice before admitting. It's because you're super hot, and I believe our natures complement one another. We both like to kick crap, and as far as I can tell, we don't really care if we live to see tomorrow. So long as today is awesome. Not expecting such a straightforward answer, Mirko burst out laughing hard enough that she needed to cradle her stomach. More importantly, at least from Izuka's perspective, her bond level increased to 54 in a single go. He didn't know if that was considered high, but it was markedly higher than 31. Having an erode style system might not be so bad, thought Izuku, ignoring Mirko's raucous laughter to shovel some more of her delicious food into his mouth. 
Gradually regaining her reason, Mirko exhaled a much softer chuckle as she remarked, I haven't laughed like that in a while. You're a real cheeky brat, you know that? Pining after a woman, what, 11 years older than you? Have you ever even held a girl's hand before? I've done a lot more than that, revealed Izuku, meeting Mirko's gaze as he asserted, I ain't no cherry boy. Blinking in surprise, Mirko asked, Seriously? Though, given how you act, I'm not too surprised. Girls are pretty weak too, assertive and strong boys, and even I fell prey to similar types in middle and high school. Seeing Izuka's brows furrow, a teasing smile developed across Mirko's face as she asked, What? Disappointed that my cherry has already been popped? Man, you must be down bad. Well, too bad for you, but I accumulated quite a bit of experience in middle and high school. Though, to be fair, a lot of that can be attributed to my quirk. Since I possess all the qualities of a rabbit, I'm shabowinkingly charged by nature. Fortunately, I'm also an agonophiliac, so I get off more from fighting than shaboinkin these days. Raising her hands and shrugging in a gesture of mock helplessness, Mirko added, Either way, I have no interest in some brat. I'm not saying your chances are zero, but you'd need to trigger me, and the only way to do that is by defeating, or at the very least, impressing me. And let me tell you, after your performance on the beach, that's an uphill battle. Stretching her arms over her head, Mirko issued what Izuku believed to be an intentionally sonorous moan. Then, with slightly narrowed eyes and a teasing smile, she remarked, Well, I suppose there is another way you can get me riled up. Ever given a massage before? Quite a few times, replied Izuku, his expression, and tone a little flatter than usual. In fact, I'm pretty good at it. Raising her brows, Mirko asked, Is that so? Before adding, Then, lucky for you, my body is usually tense after returning from a patrol. If you can help me relax, I may reward you with a reach around. For a little boy like you, that should be plenty. With Mirko making a size gesture with her index finger and thumb, Izuka's expression hardened as he raised both hands, spreading them about 20 centimeters apart as he said, I am not a little boy. Blinking in genuine surprise, Mirko's expression was momentarily blank before a somewhat predatory smile developed across her face. If Izuku wasn't lying, his chances of success had shot up quite a bit. If she knew Izuku could help increase her strength, she might have pounced on him then and there. Name, Rumi Yusijiyama. Quirk Rabbit. Bond Level, 31 to 65. Current Level, 83. Effective Level, 219. Attributes, Strength, 388. Agility, 442. Vitality, 647. Intelligence, 39. Dexterity, 460. Luck, 219. Free attributes, 415. Perks, uh, party invitation required. Wait, I'm not going with you? Asked Izuku, standing outside Mirko's house as she prepared to go on her afternoon patrol. Are you an idiot? Retorted Mirko. I won't stop you if you want to try, but you're still injured after I kicked your but this morning. Besides, you aren't even in your costume. Did I hit you so hard you went dumb in the brain? Furrowing his brows slightly, Izuku pointedly replied, It won't even take me five minutes to get changed. Shrugging her shoulders, Mirko retorted, As we sit here gabbing, villains could be running amok in my territory. Get changed over and chase after me if you want, but it would be better if you just stayed here and focused on recovering. We're fighting again first thing tomorrow morning, without waiting for Izuka's response. Mirko abruptly squatted low, before kicking off against the ground with tremendous force. Izuku had to cover his face to shield it from the dust and debris she kicked up, his expression somewhat grim as he thought. I'm not surprised, but this is going to be more difficult than expected. Understanding he had no hope of catching up to Mirko, when she could basically run through the sky, Izuka made his way back inside her house, resisting the urge to give it a more thorough search as he made his way to the onsen-like bath. His body still ached quite a bit, so he elected to heed Mirko's advice. 
focusing on his recovery so that he didn't embarrass himself the following day. Entering the changing room that preceded the bath, Izuka peeled off his clothes before carrying them to the nearby laundry hamper. As he did so, a very racy pair of underwear came into view. At a glance, it resembled a thong made of lace, giving it a translucent quality that would doubtlessly look great against the backdrop of Mirko's bronze skin. Right, she does live alone, thought Izuku, placing his neatly folded laundry next to the hamper and pretending he hadn't seen Mirko's visibly worn underwear. A small part of him was tempted to pocket the probably fragrant garment, but he repressed it thoroughly as he made his way into the bath. Oh, hell yes, groaned Izuku, sinking his body into the murky mineral waters of Mirko's artificial hot spring. The notion that he might one day be able to bathe with the bronze-skinned bunny briefly crossed his mind, but his main focus was on his status. Along with eating, hot baths, and proper rest were the most optimal ways for Izuku to recover his vitality and heal from injuries. While bathing, Izuku could literally see his vitality replenishing in real time, and as it did so, so too did his other attributes. This was one of the greatest perks of digitalization, as even if he lost a limb, he would theoretically be able to regenerate so long as his vitality was replenished. At the very least, that's what the information in his mind professed. He had never actually tried it, for obvious reasons, hmm, noticing his vitality increase beyond 100. Ultimately settling on 102, Izuku came to a grim realization. He knew there had to be training methods for each of the six attributes, but he had yet to personally verify the methods for intelligence and vitality, since he generally kept them higher than his other stats. Now, he knew exactly how to increase his vitality. He simply needed to get the crap kicked out of him and then recover. At least, that's what made the most sense since the injuries he sustained using one for all had never provided an increase. Well, at least I'll be able to grind some AP during my stay, thought Izuku, simultaneously activating one of his rerolls to redistribute his stats. He didn't need the eidetic memory perk ATM, and his experience gains after getting his, but kicked were fairly low. Thus, Izuku removed 50 points from his intelligence and 30 points from his luck, allowing him to increase his strength and agility to 50. Name, Izuku Midoriya. Quirk, Digitalization, Transfer, Stockpiling, Singularity, Gear Shift, Sealed, Fargene, Sealed, Danger Sense, Sealed, Black Whip, Smokescreen, Sealed, Float, Sealed. Current Level, 27, 849,008 EXP. Effective level, 39. Attributes, strength, 10 to 50. Agility, 10 to 50. Vitality, 102 to 100. Intelligence, 100 to 50. Dexterity, 100. Luck, 75 to 47. Two points from vitality. Free attributes, zero rerolls available. One, perks. Bronze skin, fleet-footed, lesser regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, nimble fingers, keen senses. That should do it, thought Izuku. I would be able to boost nearly as much as before, but I, I should be able to take more of a beating if I muster the energy of one for all at the moment of impact. I'll just use this as an opportunity to hone my battle senses, as he couldn't imagine a way to defeat Mirko without going all out, at the potential cost of his life. Izuka decided on the most pragmatic approach. If a single beating could net him two points in vitality, that meant he could gain upwards of 14 AP before the end of the week. This was much faster than his more orthodox training methods, but he was prepared to suffer a bit in the name of gains. Getting his butt kicked was a small price to pay for nearly three full levels in stats. A few hours after Mirko's departure, Izuko heard a distant thud and felt a light tremor. Unsurprisingly, Mirko appeared a few minutes later, seeking him out directly. Seeing Izuku in the middle of using her custom-made leg press, Mirko's brows perked up as she remarked, Oh, already healthy enough to start training? Or is this your attempt at physical therapy? 
Locking the weights into place, Izuku rose to his feet, giving Mirko a view of his well-defined chest and abdominal muscles as he replied, Welcome back. And yeah, I've pretty much fully recovered. I'm ready for round two whenever you are. Though she snorted through her nose, Mirko narrowed her eyes, crossed her arms, and smiled as she said, Training shirtless to try and rile me up isn't the worst approach. As for round two, it'll have to wait until tomorrow morning. I might not have trouble kicking your but, but I need time to cool down after a patrol. Besides, did you forget our previous arrangement? Or is it that you don't want to give me a massage? Exhaling a scoff-like chuckle, Izuka remarked, I never knew you had a sense of humor. Only a complete idiot or a eunuch could refuse such an offer. Nodding her head in approval, Mirko half-turned, intending to leave the gym after remarking, Good. Give me a minute to wipe down my body and get changed. And keep in mind, you only get one shot at this. If your skills are dog crap, the only thing you'll be comforting the remainder of your stay is yourself. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, Mirko turned around and sauntered out of the gym. As for Izuku, he just rolled his eyes and grabbed a towel to wipe his face. He wouldn't call himself a professional, but he was fairly confident in his massage skills. He could also smell the arousal exuding from Mirko's body, undoubtedly the result of getting riled up while out on patrol. So the only thing he needed to be cautious of was being reserved. After all, this was very clearly a test to see if he was all bark and no bite. Since Mirko hadn't told him to meet her anywhere, Izuku elected to return to his workout instead of simply waiting for her return. He was pretty sure this was the correct decision as Mirko returned with a smile on her face, commenting, You're pretty enthusiastic about training, huh? That's good. It's fine to fool around a bit, but if you slack off too much, you'll become a useless piece of crap. Racking his weights, Izuka made no effort to conceal his gaze as he gave Mirko a once-over, sincerely responding, and I thought you looked good in your costume. You have an amazing physique. With Mirko wearing little more than a pair of black yoga pants, a matching sports bra, and socks, Izuka's throat tightened involuntarily. As far as he could tell, these three were the only garments she was wearing, all but confirming his suspicions that she was testing to see if he would attack or retreat. Rolling her eyes, Mirko lazily replied, Tell me something I don't know, before looking around the gym and asking, Where are we doing this? You're the wannabe masseuse, so tell me what I should do. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuko answered, That depends on your level of tension. If you just want a back and shoulder massage, you can sit on one of the weight benches. If you're especially sore and want something more thorough like a deep tissue massage, I would ask you to lie down on one of the stretching mats. The only problem with that is your melons. With how big they are, I can't imagine it would be too comfortable lying flat on your stomach. Narrowing her eyes in amusement, Mirko asked, Then what would you suggest, oh master masser? Without any hesitation, Izuka replied, Unless you have a massage table tucked away in a closet somewhere, your bed would probably be the best choice. The futon you lent me is the alternative. Though she maintained her smile, Mirko snorted through her nose and retorted, and let you drink in my scent whenever you sleep? Nice try, kid, but we're using my bed. Raising his brows, Izuku offered a retort of his own, asking, and you think I have a problem with that? Rolling her eyes a second time, Mirko turned around saying, follow me, before leading the way to her bedroom. Izuku's cockiness, was beginning to annoy her a bit, but she didn't hate it. Japan's population had dwindled by more than 30% after the war, yet the birth rates hadn't increased much due to many Japanese men being herbivores. Things were a bit different among the hero community, but due to the average hero's moral code, they were often incredibly boring. Mirko also resented those who teamed up with others, so she would be lying if she said she didn't have at least a few expectations for Izuko. After reaching Mirko's room, a remarkably cluttered dwelling with clothes scattered about haphazardly and an unmade bed, the owner of said room turned to Izuku and warned, if you have something to say, eat it. 
You're not even supposed to be here, so I don't want to hear jack crap about how messy it is. Tilting his head to the side, Izuka questioned, Why would I care about something like that? You should see how messy my room gets when I'm in the middle of a project. You can't even see the floor. With a height difference approaching 12 centimeters, Mirko had to look up at Izuku when they were close together. The room's low light made it difficult for normal people to see, but her night vision was better than her sight during the day. As a result, she could see Izuka's face clearly, and it didn't seem he was lying. What kind of projects do you work on? asked Mirko, not really caring, but feeling obligated to ask as she made her way over to her bed. Following close behind, Izuku explained, I've always been proficient with my hands and fingers, so I dabble in engineering and the development of support items. I even have my own workshop, though I don't get to use it much due to my recent focus on training. MMM. Is that so? asked Mirko, crawling onto her bed and lying on her stomach, using her elbows for support as she looked back to add. Then let's see you put those fingers to work. With Mirko's wagon appearing even more enticing while she was lying on her stomach, Izuku could hardly tear his eyes away from it. Fortunately, this wasn't his first rodeo, so he unhesitantly climbed onto the bed, earning himself a narrow-eyed stare from the beautiful bunny-eared woman as he straddled her thighs, nestled against her behind. Then, without dawdling, he began to massage her well-defined back and shoulder muscles, pushing up the fabric and working around the fabric of her sports bra as if it were the most natural thing in the world to do. You're actually really good at this, groaned Mirko, her face becoming increasingly red as she bit down on her pillow. No, you're just really sensitive, asserted Izuku, pressing his thumbs firmly into the tissue above Mirko's tail moving his fingers in a circular motion before working his way up her back. In an exceptionally husky tone, Mirko practically growled, Just take the compliment, you cheeky little squit. It's the truth, affirmed Izuku. Now, turn over and raise your left leg. I'm going to stretch out your ligaments and massage your thigh and calf. Though she was tempted to kick Izuku across the room, Mirko didn't want to damage her home. She was really starting to feel it. So she turned over, staring intently at Izuku as he straddled her right thigh and pushed up her left leg. He had spent the past 15 minutes grinding against her, so she wasn't even remotely surprised when he pulled himself closer to her, pressing his admittedly sizable bulge against the moist lining of her yoga pants as he began massaging her leg, never once breaking eye contact. After a prolonged silence, Mirko exhaled a faint, throaty chuckle, before adopting a narrow-eyed grin as she remarked, You really want to schmuck me, don't you? Returning a smile of his own, Izuku asked, Would it be over the top to admit I've been dreaming about it for the past two years? A little, admitted Mirko, her grin becoming even more prominent. But I'm not the type to fret over the past, so I won't hold it against you. Punctuating her statement, Mirko took advantage of the fact Izuku was holding up her leg to hook it around him, forcibly changing their positions so that she was on top. You really went and did it, brat, said Mirko, her crimson eyes gaining a fierce glimmer. I thought you were bullcrapping me and pretending to be mature, but now I can see you aren't just fooling around. There's just one thing you overlooked, tearing the front of Izuka's gym pants. Rather than simply removing them, Mirko's smile became especially vicious as she added, I don't get schmucked. I ride my men until I'm satisfied or they break. And let me tell you this. Unsheathing Izuka's meat grinder, Mirko licked her lips and said, I am never satisfied since Izuku had dared to trigger her heat response. Mirko wasted no time in tearing away at her yoga pants, revealing that she had, in fact, been Bilingo. Then, with practiced ease, she mounted Izuku, a feral grin, developing across her face. Contrasting Mirko's expectations, Izuku responded to her actions by grabbing her voluminous Jiat, a fiery and determined look on his face as he asserted, I won't go down that easily, exhaling a barking, ha! Huh? Mirko began to move way faster than an ordinary woman might have as she asked, 
Want to know an interesting factoid about rabbits? The males can copulate up to 40 times a day, but even that isn't enough to satisfy a female in heat. I'm about to wring your balls so thoroughly that you'll have to beg me to stop. The two then proceeded to go at it like wild rabbits. Pun intended in Mirko's case. Mirko introduced Izuku to her well-practiced and perfected Amazonian techniques and positions. Izuku responded by channeling all for one through his 20-centimeter defeater. He nearly blew Mirko's cheeks out. The result, name, Rumi Yusujiyama, Quirk Rabbit, Bond Level, 65 to 88, Current Level, 83, Effective Level, 219, Attributes, Strength, 388, Agility, 442, Vitality, 647, Intelligence, 39, Dexterity, 460, Luck, 219 to 223, Free Attributes, 415, Perks Party Invitation Required. Staring up at the ceiling of Mirko's room, Izuku had a contented smile on his face as he cradled the sleeping bunny girl, using his chest as a pillow. He was utterly exhausted but very satisfied with how things had played out. It hadn't even been 17 hours since he showed up at Mirko's place, and the two of them were already sharing a bed. She was bound to beat the crap out of him come morning. But for the time being, Izuka felt as though he had successfully tamed the peacefully sleeping rabbit named Rumi Yusujiyama, Quirk Rabbit, Bond Level, 88 to 92. Current level, 83. Effective level, 219. Attributes. Strength, 388 to 181. Agility, 442 to 163. Vitality, 647 to 308. Intelligence, 39. Dexterity, 460 to 210. Luck, 223 to 224. Free attributes. 415. Perks. Uh, party invitation required. Seeing that Mirko's strength, agility, and dexterity still had a positive value, even as she slept, Izuka knew she was at least somewhat aware of her surroundings. Thus, while gently squeezing her shoulder, he planted a kiss on her forehead, whispering, Thanks for giving me a chance to prove myself. I hope I was able to satisfy you, at least a little, though she really was asleep. Mirko's ear twitched in response to Izuka's words. At the same time, she nestled a little closer to him, muttering, I'm so gonna kick your butt, in a sleepy tone, before immediately returning to her peaceful slumber. Returning his gaze to the ceiling, Izuka thought, meh, it was worth it, before closing his eyes and trying to fall asleep. Because of Mirko's aroma and the heavy fragrance of Sheboink in the air, however, it was easier said than done. After all, even though his balls were empty, his steadfast friend was still ready and raring to go. It was actually kind of concerning, making him wonder whether Mirko's hyperpotent pheromones functioned as a kind of aphrodisiac. Startling Izuku awake, less than an hour after he had finally fallen asleep, Mirko was repeating, Crap, crap, crap. Crap! As she hurriedly grabbed and put on some clothes. Rising to a half-lying position, Izuku asked, What's wrong? In a lazy, half-asleep tone. You go back to your sleep! Shouted Mirko, causing Izuku's eyes to widen as she bared her teeth and practically hissed at him. Deciding it was probably wisest to comply, Izuku laid back down, rolled over, and pretended to sleep as Mirko finished getting dressed. When she was done, she promptly bolted out of the room, presumably departing as Izuko heard the sound of a thunderclap moments later. Rising to a seated position, Izuka stared in the direction of Mirko's open door, various thoughts crossing his mind as he pondered. Don't tell me the Nomu attack occurred as it did in canon, but I didn't hear anything about Ida's brother being seriously injured. Could Stain have decided to act in a different city? Since he was unaware of Mirko's little secret, Izuku could only guess she was responding to some unforeseen emergency. While that was certainly the case, 
The situation wasn't nearly as serious as he thought it was. As for Mirko, she was just relieved most hospitals and clinics were open 24-7. With how much Izuku had released inside her, she was certain she would have been pregnant otherwise. Startling Izuku awake a second time, Mirko shouted, Wake up, you little crap, while tossing a cold, wet towel onto his face. When he immediately sat up, removing the towel, she added, I'm busy throughout the day, so training starts before dawn. Get your pants on and meet me outside. It's time for round two. Finished with what she had to say, Mirko turned to leave, but stopped when Nezuka called out to her, saying, Wait, hold up. There's something I need to tell you. Thinking Izuku was about to confess or something similar, Mirko looked back at him over her shoulder, stating, Listen, kid, last night was great, but things would never work out between us. I'm down to Sheboink whenever you are, but don't expect me to get all lovey-dovey and treat you like my boyfriend. Smiling wryly, Izuka remarked, The thought never even crossed my mind. Now, what I want to talk about is my quirk. I received permission from the principal to tell you about it, but I never got the chance, since you knocked me out and left me concussed the moment I arrived. Though she was a little annoyed about Izuku, saying the thought of them being a couple had never crossed his mind, Mirko ignored it, crossing her arms as she said, Then hurry up and explain. I hate dumbass who beat around the bush, trying to sound smart. I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku, adding, Have you ever played a video game? More specifically, an RPG where you could assign stats to your character. Furrowing her brows slightly, Mirko pointed out, Just because I live on an island, it doesn't mean I've lost touch with the rest of the world. I used to game a ton when I was in elementary and middle school. Nodding his head, Izuku revealed, Well, my quirk, digitalization, is a lot like that. It allows me to keep track of my progress with experience, lets me level up, and most importantly, it allows me to assign my attributes to one of six stats, being strength, agility, vitality, intelligence, dexterity, and luck. Blinking in surprise, Mirko asked, Seriously? I've never heard of a quirk like that before. Does that mean if you reach the max level, you'll be the strongest in the world? Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku replied, presumably. Unfortunately, the experience required to level up increases exponentially every 10 levels. But that's beside the point. What I really need to inform you of is one of the benefits of my quirk. Seeing Mirko waiting for him to continue, Izuku explained, Last night, when we were doing it like rabbits dash, interrupting Izuku's explanation, Mirko narrowed her eyes and warned, don't get cheeky, in a threatening tone, raising his hands in a gesture of mock surrender. Izuku continued, Well, in the middle of us shabo-inking, I received a notification telling me you had met the conditions to join my party. I've never invited anyone before, so I don't know all the pros and cons of doing so. However, what I do know is that it will let you assign the free attribute points you've collected as well as receive quirk-like abilities, known as perks. Holding up her right hand, and using her left to cradle her head, Mirko said, Hold up. That's too much information all at once. Are you trying to say that if I join this party, I can level up and get stronger? Isn't that a little too ridiculous? Shaking his head, Izuko answered, I'm just telling you how it is. Whether you believe it or not doesn't really matter. I can prove it if you agree when I ask. Rumi Yusujiyama, would you like to join my party? Though she initially stared at Izuku as if he'd lost his mind, Mirko's eyes widened when a tiny blue window, similar to a hologram, appeared in front of her face. Is this some kind of prank? asked Mirko, even as she extended her finger to press the yes button. Hologram technology was currently very rare, but it was gradually becoming more prevalent. Thus, even though Izuku appeared to be unclothed, she didn't discount the possibility he had a tiny projector hidden somewhere. After pressing yes, Mirko was surprised a second time when her status window appeared before her. At the same time, she noticed a few words had appeared above Izuka's head, indicating his name and level. 
Realizing that Izuku may have been telling the truth, Mirko was about to ask him for an explanation, but stopped when she noticed her intelligence attribute. She didn't exactly pride herself on her intelligence, but her right eye twitched a bit as she growled. If this turns out to be a joke, the only way you're getting off this island is via a rescue chopper taking you to the ICU. Though Mirko's bloodlust caused goose pimples to break out across his arms and legs, Izuku appeared calm as he replied, Lucky for me, it's not. Now, how about you sit that beautiful brown, but down so we can discuss your attributes and how to best allocate them. Narrowing her eyes, Mirko briefly considered dragging Izuku out of her room by his meat grinder, but promptly dismissed the idea. Instead, she stared at him for a moment, stating, You're on thin ice, brat, before moving over to sit next to him. She nearly regretted her decision when he wrapped his arm around her, resting his hand on her outer thigh, but she endured since she was pretty interested in what he had to say. Over the course of his conversation with Mirko, Izuka learned quite a few things about the party system. First and foremost, any pop-ups, meaning notifications or status windows, were visible to everyone. Secondly, it was possible to check the status of other members and their proximity relative to the speaker with the voice command, check party status. Lastly, when Mirko joined his party, he got a long list of perks he could confer her, but only six in total. Though it was impossible to see detailed information, such as quirks and perks using the check party status command, Mirko had Azuka show her his status page directly remarking, Wow, you have a ton of quirks. Yeah, it's complicated, replied Azuka, but that's not important right now. We should be focused on allocating your attributes and choosing perks that suit your nature and fighting style. Prompted by Izuka's words, Mirko returned her attention to her status screen, frowning as she remarked, I feel a strong urge to increase my intelligence, but I've gotten this far without it. It might be better to just pump my strength, agility, and dexterity to 500 before investing the rest into vitality. Or maybe I can invest everything into vitality to choose one of the stronger perks. Pulling up the window displaying various perks, Izuka focused on the group that required 1000 vitality, remarking, Super regeneration might be a good choice. If it functions similarly to the quirk of the same name, you could even regenerate lost limbs. Waving her hand, Mirko confidently remarked, I've already been a hero for eight, going on nine years. If I were going to lose a limb, I would have lost it as a rookie. Now, show me the perks related to luck. If it turns out we can share experience, I might be able to power level you a bit. Though he did as Mirko instructed, Izuko asked, Are you sure? Pumping your luck isn't the worst idea, but doing so to help me is a little much. I really appreciate the sentiment, but dash, before Izuko could finish, Mirko elbowed him in the ribs hard enough to trigger his bronze skin perk across his torso, a serious look on her face as she said, I got as strong as I am through hard work and effort. I would be lying if I said the thought of getting stronger didn't rile me the hell up, but I don't need handouts from some brat. If luck is related to talent, I'll boost it to the max and get stronger the same way I always have, training my butt off and beating the crap out of people. Ignoring the pain in his ribs, Izuku adopted a smile and remarked, You really are an incredible woman! Snorting through her nose, Mirko retorted, Yeah, and I don't need you or anyone else to point it out. I know exactly how badass I am because I'm the one who put in the work. Now let's get this over with so we can get to our training. Don't think I've forgotten about kicking your butt. Right. Replied Izuku, showing Mirko the list of luck-based perks before helping her allocate all of her AP to luck. He was the only one who could do so, so... If members of his party wanted to use the free attributes they got from leveling, they would need to come to him in person. Name. Rumi Yusujiyama. Quirk Rabbit. Bond level. 92 to 93. Current level. 83. Effective level. 219. Attributes. Strength. 388. Agility. 442. Vitality. 647. Intelligence. 
39 to 50. Dexterity, 460. Luck, 224 to 628. Free attributes, 0. Perks, Fleet-Footed, Thunderous Thighs, Healthy Body, Second Wind, Keen Senses, Lucky Rabbit's Foot. Though the increase in luck didn't make her feel any different, Mirko knew Azuka's power was the real deal when she acquired the Healthy Body and Keen Senses perks. The moment she acquired them, most of her fatigue vanished, and each of her five senses became much sharper. As for her other perks, she didn't feel like Fleet-Footed did anything, but Thunderous Thighs may as well have been made for her. It allowed her to accelerate and decelerate nigh instantaneously, storing the energy in her thighs before unleashing as blades of wind, something Izuku referred to as fangs. As such, she christened the technique Lunafong. Lunafong! shouted Mirko, sending a crescent-shaped blade of energy flying at Izuku. Fortunately, she was a master at controlling her strength. So even though the blade impacted him directly, cutting across his chest and arms, it only left a shallow cut on his bronze skin. Hissing due to the fiery pain, Izuku extended Black Whip to a nearby tree, pulling himself away just as Mirko landed a destructive dive kick where he had been standing. Since he was too weak to fight her directly, they were currently playing a game of cat and mouse in the forest surrounding her home. In essence, she was chasing him around to acclimate to her perks while he did his best to survive as long as possible. Seeing Izuku begin to weave and bob between trees like a certain web-slinger from New York, Mirko's already predatory smile became even more sinister as she abruptly combined two of her ultimate techniques, Luna Ring and Luna Fong, christening the ability Luna Eclipse as she spun her body in a swift circular arc extending both her legs 180 degrees from each other. The result was a perfectly circular fong spreading out from her body, slicing through several trees and leaving a deep gash in a nearby boulder. Hearing a sharp whooshing sound, Izuka dove forward just as the fong of energy passed over him. Its strength had weakened considerably by then, but a cold sweat broke out across Izuka's body when he got up and saw it had cut nearly halfway through the tree he dove behind. Taking advantage of Azuka's momentary stupor, though, he could at least get his guard up. Mirko crashed down on him from above, driving her heel into his guard as she shouted, Luna Arc! Unable to endure the force of Mirko's blow, Izuku was forced to one knee as her heel forcibly uncrossed his arms and drove his hands into the dirt. Then, reversing her motion, Performing a nine-instantaneous backward somersault, Mirko added, Lunar Reversal! As she kicked him in the chin, sending him spinning head over heel through the air. And with that, even though only a few minutes had passed, everything went dark. Though he awoke to the feeling of a pleasant warmth enveloping his body, Izuku couldn't help groaning. Ugh, my head. As he gradually realized he was in the bath. Stop biatching came a familiar voice, seeming to emanate from behind Izuka's head. Fortunately, his mind wasn't playing tricks on him as Mirko was presently supporting his body, allowing him to rest against her with his head against her melons. Before Izuku could comment on the situation, Mirko asserted, You're a lot weaker than I expected. I get that you can only use your maximum power for a few seconds, but at this rate, you'll die the moment you fight a powerful villain. Even if you can take the main guy out in one punch, his goons won't hesitate to stomp your head in once you collapse. Closing his eyes, Izuku remained silent for a few moments before replying, I know, but I've only had this quirk for around two years, and it's barely been a month since I gained my amplification ability. I'm doing my best to improve, but there's only so much I can do when half my day is dedicated to general education and socializing. Recalling her struggles during school, requiring her to transfer no less than three times, Mirko promptly decided not to be too harsh on Izuku. She nearly forgot since he was so mature, but he was still a brat, bound by the expectations of adults and the restraints of society. In that regard, his talent and capabilities were probably a tremendous burden, 
Catching Izuku off guard, Mirko flatly remarked, We may have more in common than I thought, in her characteristically husky tone. Before the words could reach Izuka's lips, Mirko shook her head and said, Don't ask. As I stated previously, I'm not the type to brood over the past. Life has more meaning if you live every day as if it were your last. Emboldened by her own words, Mirko grabbed the sides of Izuka's face, surprising him with a lingering smooch before pulling away to say, Since you lost so quickly, we still have a bit of time before breakfast and my morning patrol. If you can pull yourself together, I might consider letting you blow your load a few times. Though his body protested as he did so, Izuka leaned forward and forced himself to stand, stating, Even if all my limbs were severed or broken, I'd still come running at such an offer. Raising her brows, Mirko was about to call Izuka a dumbass, but settled on rolling her eyes when she noticed his not-so-little brother rousing. It seemed even bigger when he was standing in front of her. But instead of feeling even remotely intimidated, Mirko rose to her feet, fixing her hair as she said, Let's do it in the bedroom. Cleaning this bath is already a royal pain in the butt. So, I don't want your juice getting in the water and sticking to things. Following her words, Mirko turned to leave, stepping out of the tub and letting the water drip from her body. When she didn't hear Izuka following after her, she turned around to find his eyes glued to her behind, prompting her to narrow her own and remark, Looks like you were all talk after all, adopting a serious expression and a grin. Izuka confidently retorted, Girl, don't make me carry you like a princess. Snorting through her nose, Mirko replied, You wish, before swaggering out of the room, intentionally swaying her hips as she did so. I freaking love rabbits! thought Izuku, following after Mirko with a pep that belied his fairly serious injuries, though he wasn't complaining in the slightest, especially when Mirko was present. Izuka's internship became a fairly monotonous routine of getting his but beat, schmucking, eating breakfast, seeing Mirko off, feeding her rabbits, welcoming her return, schmucking, etc. He was gaining between two to three free attributes every day, but he almost felt like Mirko's house husband waiting for her to return so he could alleviate her stress before sending her off once again. Despite her promise to show him the ropes of being a solo hero, Izuka's internship reached its final day without Mirko taking him on a single patrol. She welcomed him to join her, but since she refused to reduce her patrol speed so that he could keep up, all Izuku could do was watch her take off into the sky before returning to the gym to train. It wasn't that bad, but he lamented being so weak that he couldn't even accompany her on a simple patrol. Interrupting Izuka's training session, Mirko, having returned a lot earlier than normal, asked, Is today the last day of your internship? I forgot to keep track of the date. Racking the weight he had been squatting, Izuka replied, Yeah, and it's been fun, even if I didn't learn as much as I'd like. Yeah, sorry about that, replied Mirko, rubbing the back of her head, with an uncharacteristically awkward look on her face. She wasn't very good at apologizing to people, so instead of focusing on that, she met Izuka's gaze and said, You've worked hard this week and didn't biatch too much whenever I kicked your butt. I've prepared a little reward for you, so head to my room and wait like a good boy. Rising to his feet, Izuka quipped, I'm the best boy, before running past Mirko and making a comically mad dash for her room. She rolled her eyes as he passed her, but then adopted a smile as she imagined his reaction to her surprise. His comment about wishing he could have been her first had left at least a small impression on her heart. So Mirko had visited her old family home and dug out her middle school outfit just for him. It didn't fit her at all, the top exposing half her abdomen and the skirt barely covering a quarter of her thigh. But Mirko doubted Izuka would complain, rather, if he did she might use her penultimate technique against him, Lunati Harris, an attack where she flexed her thighs with enough force to decapitate or outright crush her opponent's head. Staring at his phone, depicting a photo of Mirko in her sailor uniform, seated on the edge of her coffee table with her, but and tail showing, Izuka would be lying if he said he didn't regret having to return home. Though Mirko hadn't bothered to see him off, 
saying goodbyes were for sentimental fools. Izuku convinced himself that she would miss him when she returned from a patrol and found an empty house. It could be wishful thinking on his part, but Mirko's level 98 bond led him to believe she had at least some affection for him. It all depended on whether the maximum level of a bond was 100. If it went even higher, Mirko might forget about him within a week. If not, it indicated she had much more than just a little affection for him. VRRR, freeing Izuku from his daydreaming, a notification informing him had received a message from Toru popped up on Izuka's screen. They had exchanged texts throughout their internships, but this was her first time sending him an attachment in more than a week. Exhaling a slightly exasperated sigh, Izuku reluctantly closed Mirko's photo to see what Toru had sent him. If he was being honest, he wasn't too enthused by the notion he had to return to high school drama, but Mirko had expressed, in no uncertain terms, they couldn't date. She said she might consider it once he graduated, but until then, she suggested he should play around with the girls at his school. Catching Izuku a little off guard, Toru's message asked, Are you missing Mirko? This probably won't make your loneliness disappear, but I hope it'll help. Click to see attachment. As Toru was something of a confidant to him, Izuku had kept her apprised of his progress with Mirko. The latter had expressed that she wouldn't care even if he announced to the entire world that they had shabboinked. But Izuku would never do that. Toru and Achiko were exceptions, since they knew his intentions before he even left. Opening the attachment Toru had sent him, Izuka's eyes widened as the image didn't show her alone. Instead, it showed her and Achiko wearing Mirko costumes as they squished their melons and cheeks together, their hands coming together to make a heart shape with a caption. There are other rabbits in the forest. Since she could see when Izuku read her message, Toru immediately sent a follow-up text to inform him that the photo was recent and that she and Achiko were having a sleepover. It was too late for him to come over, but they could do a video call if he weren't busy with something else. Though he wasn't in the mood, Izuka didn't have the heart to reject Toru's and Achiko's attempts to cheer him up. He was also a little interested in what they had in mind, so he quickly responded in the affirmative before accepting Toru's request for a video chat. Soon after, any doubts Izuku had about his chances of being involved in a threesome were thoroughly erased. Early the next morning, long before the morning bell was set to ring, Izuku was waiting outside the front gate of UA for Toru and Achiko to arrive. He had asked the two of them to come in early so he could inform Toru about his quirk. But as Achiko was fairly relentless in her desire to get with him, Izuku figured he should include her in the discussion. Arriving even earlier than Izuku had asked them to, Achiko and Toru came running over, waving their hands and shouting, We're here, izuku Kuin!" before stopping in front of him to catch their breaths. Adopting his usual smile, Izuku said, It's good to see the two of you in such high spirits. Thanks for coming in so early on our first day back to school. Recovering a bit faster than Achiko, primarily thanks to the morning jogs she had been going on, Toru replied, Are you kidding me? When you said you wanted to meet up, I came and then came running as fast as I could. Though she spoke very quickly, Izuka didn't fail to notice that Toru had mentioned coming twice. In response, he exhaled a light chuckle before suggesting, Let's head to the gymnasium. Once you hear what I have to say and experience it firsthand, you'll probably want to move your body a bit. I'll explain in more detail when we arrive. While neither girl was particularly enthused at the notion of training first thing in the morning, they obediently accompanied Izuku to one of the more isolated training gyms. However, once they heard his explanation, their moods changed drastically. Seeing herself in the mirror Izuku had prepared in advance, like actually seeing herself, Toru found herself at a complete and utter loss for words. She had believed Izuku when he gave his explanation, but when he told her there was a perk that would permit her to become visible, even if it were just a projection over her original form, she had her doubts. Nen, Turahegekuri, Quirk, Invisibility, Bond Level, 83 to 95, Current Level, 21, 
Effective level, 28. Attributes, strength, 29 to 34. Agility, 35 to 40. Vitality, 58 to 100. Intelligence, 51 to 100. Dexterity, 41 to 45. Luck, 68. Free attributes, 0. Perks, healthy body, temperature resistance, sharp mind. Form projection. Voicing is honest, thoughts aloud, Izuku asserted. You're even more beautiful than I imagined. Like, seriously, they may lack definition, but your thighs and hips could give Mirko's a run for their money. Though Toru was in her gym clothes, Izuku could tell at a glance that she was thick with three C's. He had already been aware of the fact before, but it was true what they said. Seeing was believing. With her translucent green hair, refracting warm colors depending on the angle you looked at it, and peculiar green slash yellow eyes, she was like a fairy out of a picture book, just a lot more voluptuous. Instead of responding to Izuku with words, Toru promptly pounced on him, linking her arms around his neck and dangling from his body as she gave him the most passion-filled smooch she could manage. As much as she enjoyed the perks of being invisible, Toru still felt lonely whenever people overlooked or outright disregarded her. Now, when she didn't need to use her power, everyone would be focused on her, separating from Izuka's lips nearly a minute later. Toru plainly asserted, I love you, Izuka Koen. No matter what happens, I will always love you from this moment forward. Punctuating her words, Toru gave Izuku another kiss, this time holding it for even longer while Achiko observed them with an awkward smile from the side. She had no intentions of giving up on Izuku, especially now that he had revealed a secret. But hearing another girl affirm her love for him made her feel uncomfortable. Fortunately, the person that had confessed was Toru, her co-conspirator, and a very good friend. Seemingly remembering they had a spectator, Toru released Izuku from her grasp, smiling up at him, before turning her attention to Achiko and saying, Sorry, Akakakin. I was just too happy. If you want, I'm sure Izuku wouldn't mind smooching you as well. Eh. Though she and Izuku had smooched several times, making out even, Achiko was somewhat taken aback by Toru's suggestion. Kissing at school just seemed so risque, especially when it was known there were cameras all over the place, making up Achiko's mind. Izuku extended his hand toward her, smiling as he said, Come, in a gentle, inviting tone. Moo. Though she puffed out her cheeks, Achiko walked over until she bumped her forehead into Izuka's chest. Then, after a few seconds, she raised her face to meet his, closing her eyes and accepting his smooch with a startlingly red complexion. When his and Achiko's smooch came to an end, much sooner than the one between him and Toru. Izuka surprised the petite gravity girl with a light pinch to her rear end, smiling as he said, I'll never get over how precious you are, rubbing her, but even though it didn't actually hurt, Achiko furrowed her brows and asserted, We shouldn't be doing such things in school. Nodding his head, Izuka replied, You're right. But since we were already so close to one another, I couldn't help it. You're but was too cute to resist. My hand moved on its own. Puffing out her cheeks, albeit only for a moment, Achiko gave up on chastising Izuku and instead got to the heart of the matter, averting her eyes and linking her hands behind her back as she asked, So, about your quirk? Since you already told me your secret, does that mean the two of us can you know? Leaning a little closer to Izuku, Achiko's voice was barely a whisper as she asked, are we going to do it? Deciding to be forthright, Izuka replied, I'm honestly not sure, Achiko. I want to say yes, but after my time with Mirko, I've come to feel that what I'm doing is wrong. I genuinely don't want to hurt you girls, so it might be better to stop all this before it gets out of hand. As Izuka's answer wasn't what she wanted to hear, Achiko immediately became despondent, the upper half of her face darkening as she lowered her head and muttered, I see, in a resigned tone, holding up his hand to stop Toru from speaking out. 
Izuka's expression softened as he added, However, if you're okay with being with me, even if things will doubtlessly get out of hand, I simply don't have the heart to refuse you. At this point, I'm even prepared to march through an ocean of blades or straight into hell if it'll make things work. Bouncing back immediately, Achiko pumped her fists and shouted, Of course I want us to be together. It's practically all I can think about, but I also don't want to make things difficult for you. So, if you believe I'd be a burden, I... I... Unable to carry her vigor to the end of her statement, Achiko began to tear up at the thought of separating from Izuku. They weren't officially boyfriend and girlfriend, but she would be lying if she said she didn't see them that way in her heart. She just didn't think she was good enough for him, so she teamed up with others to ensure she had at least a tiny place in his. Unaware of Achiko's thoughts, but very aware of her emotions, Izuka held her in his arms, cradling her gently as she sobbed against his chest. One of the things he hated most was seeing girls cry. So, knowing he was the cause of Achiko's suffering, he couldn't help thinking, I'm a damn jerk, with furrowed brows and a clenched jaw. Seeing the look on Izuka's face, combined with Achiko's crying, Toru felt as though a tremendous weight was placed upon her heart. However, she had already given up Izuka once, so she couldn't stand to lose him again. She really wanted Achiko to be happy, but she could no longer sacrifice her happiness for others. Thus, even if they were fighting an uphill battle with little chance of victory, Toru was determined to make things with the three of them, and whoever else Izuko ended up enticing, especially with his power. After calming down Achiko and assuring her everything would be okay, Izuka spent some time with her and Toru before the three of them made their way to class. Noticing the trio as they entered, Yairozu rose to her feet, smiling as she said, Good morning, Midoriya Kuin, Yurarika-san, and who might this be? A friend of yours, beaming so brightly that her body literally started to glow. Toru teased, Don't you recognize me, Yairozu-san? Though she was momentarily confused, certain she had never met such an ephemeral girl in her entire life, Yairozu quickly realized who she was, exclaiming, Hagakure-san, is that you? Adopting a somewhat silly smile, like someone who had won too many drinks, Toru replied, I can make myself visible now, hehe. <laughs> That's incredible, replied Yairozu. And Midoriya Kuin was right. You really are quite beautiful. It's almost magical. Exhibiting no shame, Toru mused, I know, right? I almost feel bad for all the other boys in my life, but it's their fault for not realizing they had such a beautiful girl right in front of them. Not like my Izuka Kuen. Hugging Izuka's arm, Toru unabashedly rubbed her against him with a somewhat perverse smile on her face. This earned her a raised brow look from Yairozu, asking, Were the two of you always this close? Answering in Toru's stead, Izuka stunned all three girls by pulling Achiko closer to him and saying, It's complicated, but the three of us are dating now. Recovering from her brief stupor, Yairozu adopted a very bright but discernibly practiced smile as she expressed, I'm very happy for the three of you. I wish each of you the utmost joy. With Achiko and Toru still too stunned to reply, Izuku offered a curt nod and said, Thanks, Yairozu-san. We appreciate your support. Adopting a marginally more sincere smile, Yairozu replied, Of course. Supporting one another is what friends do. Just try not to get too lovey-dovey while we're at school, okay? I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku. Then, after some light conversation, including a private chat with Achiko and Toru, the four of them worked together to prepare for class. Toru's sudden visibility caused quite a stir whenever someone showed up, but things proceeded fairly normally until homeroom, at least on the surface. Standing at the classroom's podium with his usual haggard expression, Aizawa revealed, Summer break is fast approaching. However, as this is UA, don't expect to be able to traipse about without a care in the world. This year, classes 1A and 1B will be teaming up to attend a summer training camp at an undisclosed location. But before that, 
you'll first need to overcome the final exams. That includes a written and practical exam, so you'll need to study and train hard if you want to avoid taking remedial classes while everyone else is having fun. Though everyone was initially excited by the prospect of a summer training camp, hearing Aizawa mention the final exams caused nearly half the class to deflate. They weren't concerned with the practical, but due to the sports festival and internships, only the most diligent among them had bothered to study. Fortunately, at least for those who accepted her invitation, Yayoza offered to help out anyone struggling with the course material, inviting them over to her house to study. With the first half of the day passing in a flash, the girls from class 1A had, once again, assembled at the same lunch table. Once everyone had sat down, Mina kicked things off by asking, So, the two of you are dating Izuka Kuin? With a mischievous smile directed at Achiko and Toru, pressing the pads of her fingers together, Achiko bashfully replied, We just started dating, while Toru appearing especially bubbly appended. That's right, with a very happy smile on her face. Nodding her head in approval, Mina mused, that's great, before leaning forward with her elbows on the table, her voice low as she asked, Now, give us the deets. We want all the juicy details. That includes how you suddenly became visible, Toru-san. You would have mentioned it in the group chat if it happened during your internship, so it must have occurred recently. It can't be a coincidence you started dating Izuku around the same time. Instead of answering Mina's question directly, Toru cupped her cheeks and replied, It's the power of love, with a somewhat silly smile, and a small amount of drool leaking from her lip. Realizing that Toru might be a lost cause, at least until she returned to Earth, Mina, alongside the rest of the girls at the table, shifted their gazes to Achiko. The latter was too honest for her own good, but she at least tried to keep things under wraps, shrinking in her seat as she muttered, Ah, it's a secret, while avoiding the other girl's gazes. Adopting an even broader smile, Mina sat up straight, making a helpless gesture as she said, If that's the case, there's nothing we can do about it. Though, I do seem to recall everyone here promising to inform the entire group about their progress with izuka -kun. You and Torusen are pretty sneaky. Shrinking even further into herself, Achiko muttered, it's not like I was trying to be sneaky, with an increasingly nervous look on her face. She knew better than anyone just how sneaky she had been, so the pressure she was experiencing was immense, increasing Achiko's feelings of guilt tenfold. Tsuyu stared directly at her and said, I didn't know you and Izuka-chan were so close. Did you meet up during your internships or something, Ribbit? Unable to withstand the pressure and guilt, Achiko abruptly rose from her seat, shouting, Do you just give me a moment? Before running over to the boy's table and whispering something into Izuka's ear. A wry smile developed across the latter's face. But he eventually nodded in response to whatever Achiko had asked him, prompting her to return to the girl's table, visibly relieved as she plopped into her seat. What was that about? asked Mina. Did you just run over to ask izuka Kuin permission for something? If so, the relationship between you seems pretty advanced. Returning a markedly more relaxed, somewhat excited smile, Achiko replied, It's because Izuka Kuin has a big secret, something he can't reveal to others since it would cause chaos around the world. Blinking in surprise, Mina asked, Does it have anything to do with Toru-sen becoming visible? Nodding her head with a bit of vigor, Achiko replied, It does. But before I tell you what it is, each of you has to promise to keep it a secret. If word of Izuka's power got out, it would cause a lot of trouble. Though she crossed her arms and had a somewhat conflicted look, Mina didn't hesitate to answer. Well, I certainly wouldn't tell anyone. But if it's such a big secret, why are you willing to tell us? Tilting her head to the side, Achiko issued a cutesy hmm before answering. Izuka Kuin said it was okay because he trusts everyone here. I also feel guilty about going behind everyone's back, so if it comes down to it, I don't mind sharing him with everyone here. Understanding exactly what Achiko was suggesting, expressions of shock, disbelief, 
and mild intrigue marred the faces of the girls seated at the table. Yairozu was one of the calmer ones, asking, Does this have anything to do with Midoriya Kuen's secret? Nodding her head, Achiko replied, Yeah, but I'm not really sure I'm the best person to explain things. The two of us haven't done it yet, so I've yet to experience it directly. After blinking several times, a look of realization, accompanied by a massive grin, developed across Mina's face as she looked at Toru, softly yet excitedly asking, You and Izuka Kuen schmucked? What was it like? Puffing her chest out with pride, Toru replied, It's true, while cupping her cheeks, grinning foolishly as she added, And it was awesome. Izuka Kuen is really big, so I thought it would hurt a lot. It kind of did at the very beginning, but then it became super amazing. To Inserting herself into the conversation, Jiro leaned forward to ask, How big? In a curious tone. She wasn't particularly enthused by the prospect of becoming a member of Azuka's harem, but they had similar tastes in music and got decent enough, so she didn't dismiss the notion outright. It ultimately came down to whether or not the other girls were interested. If she were the only one left out, she might join just to feel included. Holding her hands up, Toru made a somewhat exaggerated gesture with her index fingers answering, Around this big? I've never measured it, but Izuku said it's something like 20 centimeters. Isn't that too big? asked Suyu, recovering a bit quicker than the other girls. Shaking her head, Toru replied, I thought so too, but it turned out not to be a problem. In fact, it felt really, really good. I'm looking forward to the next time that seeing how happy Toru was. Various thoughts crossed the minds of the girls at the table. Fortunately, at least Yairozu hadn't forgotten the original topic of their discussion, asking, What does any of this have to do with Midoriya Kuen's quirk? With a faint but perceptible blush on her face. With Yairozu directing the question at her, causing everyone else to turn her way, an uncomfortable smile developed across Achiko's face as she rubbed the back of her head, answering, Well, the truth is, after dodging awkward questions for the better part of an hour, Izuku was glad to be back in the classroom. He had the distinct impression the girls kept staring at him on the way over, but he pretended not to notice a relaxed smile on his face, even as Mineta drilled a hole into the back of his head with his envious gaze. Quiet down, said Aizawa, entering the classroom with a very beautiful person following close behind. Midnight Sensei, shouted several boys within the class specifically Mineta, Kaminari, and Siro, waving her hand with a characteristically seductive look on her face. Midnight spiritedly replied, Good afternoon, beautiful boys and girls. I hope everyone had fun during their internships. Rolling his eyes from behind the podium, Aizawa waited for things to calm down before revealing, for today's foundational heroics training, we'll be splitting the boys and girls into separate groups. The boys will come with me to Field Beta to practice handling hostage situations, and the girls will stay here for a lesson regarding the logistics of being a female pro. Now, if you're a boy, grab your costumes and head to the Beta Locker Room to get changed. With the boys grabbing their costumes and quickly departing, the six girls from Class 1A soon found themselves alone with Midnight. A very tense atmosphere permeated the classroom as for nearly three whole minutes. No one said anything until midnight broke the ice. A sadistic smile on her face as she asked, Based on how nervous everyone looks, I take it you already know why you've been gathered here, separated from the boys? Raising her hand like the dutiful student she was, Yairoza answered, Could it be related to Midoriya Kuen? Covering her mouth, midnight feigned surprise, exclaiming, Oh my, before lowering her hand and adopting a marginally more serious but still lascivious smile as she explained, Well, I can't deny this has something to do with Midoriya Kuen. The real reason is more innocuous. The principal believed it would be beneficial to implement a general Shaboyn Ked curriculum for the first year students. I'm starting with you, but you can be sure the boys will receive a similar lesson later. Hearing that they hadn't been singled out, the girls of class one exhaled a nearly unanimous sigh. 
They thought they were about to receive a lesson on good morals and decency, but it turned out to be a simple remedial course, transitioning into the topics of pregnancy and its influence on the careers of pro-heroines. At least, that's what it seemed like until midnight surprised them halfway through the lecture, licking her lips before saying, Now about Midori Akuin. With classes wrapping up for the day, Izuku intended to return home and study on his own when Yairozu asked, would you like to come over to my place for a study session, Midori Akuin? Minasan, Jirosan, Kaminari Kuin, Siro Kuin, and Ojiro Kuin will be there as well. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, I appreciate the offer, Yairozu san, but I'm confident I'll be able to place first or second without issue. Maybe some other time. Returning a nod, Yairozu repeated, Some other time then before making way for the trio of girls very clearly waiting to approach Izuku. With Yairozu departing with Jiro, Achiko, Toru, and Tsuyu crowded around Izuka's desk, the latter suggesting, let's study together, Izuka-chan. Piggybacking off of Tsuyu's words, Toru happily shouted, yeah, if we have someone as smart as Izuka-kun teaching us, we're bound to pass. Appearing much calmer than Toru, Achiko somewhat bashfully asked, is it okay if we study with you, Izuku Kuin? Resisting the urge to point out that Tsuyu would be fine on her own and that Toru now had 100 intelligence, Izuku replied, Sure, sounds like fun. But where will we be studying? Rubbing the back of her head, Achiko replied, Well, we could all go to my apartment, but there isn't much room. Getting straight to the point, Tsuyu asked, What about your place, Izuku Kuin? I'm kind of interested in seeing where you live, Ribbit. Since Nizu hadn't prohibited him from bringing people over, Izuku replied, I don't mind. I mean, it's certainly the most convenient place for us to meet up. Just don't be too surprised when you see it. Though they were initially confused by Izuku's words, Achiko, Toru, and Tsuyu understood the reason for his warning when, instead of leaving the campus, he showed them to a large house near the faculty living quarters. Do you really live here, Izuka Kuin? asked Achiko, her tone conveying the disbelief on her face. Nodding his head, Izuka replied, I can't go into details, but the school is allowing my mother and me to live on campus for the duration of my stay at UA. I'll tell you more when I'm allowed to. Hearing that he wasn't allowed to give them an explanation, the three girls decided not to probe into the matter. Instead, they followed him into the surprisingly secure building, meeting Izuka's mother and partaking in a brief house tour before accompanying him to his room. This is your room? asked Toru. I never got a good look at it through the phone. It's a lot more Spartan than I was expecting. Well, I haven't been living here too long, replied Izuka. Give me a few weeks and it'll probably look like the inside of the support department's development studio. While responding to Toru's inquiry, Izuku pulled out the textbooks they would require for their study group. When he did, the three girls seemed genuinely confused by his actions, Tsuyu remarking, You're surprisingly innocent, Izuka-chan. I thought it was fairly obvious we didn't come over to study Ribbit. As if it was his turn to be confused, Izuku raised his brows and asked, What do you mean? I mean, I know what you mean. But your presence, Tsuyu-chan, led me to believe otherwise. Karo, becoming visibly disheartened, Tsuyu asked, Do you not like me, Izuka-chan? Exhaling a sigh, Izuka muttered, This again, before shaking his head, meeting Tsuyu's gaze and asserting, You know that isn't the case. The thing is, I already have two girlfriends. If you get involved with us, Tsuyu-chan, I can't guarantee your happiness. Leaving Izuku a little taken aback, Tsuyu promptly replied, That's fine. We've already decided to support one another, so you don't have to force yourself to make each of us happy. Izuka-chan, just keep being the way you are, and things will work out well enough, Ribbit. Though he already had a good idea of what Tsuyu was alluding to, a wry smile developed across Izuka's face as he asked, When you say we, instead of answering Izuku, Tsuyu shifted her gaze to Toru and Achiko, allowing the latter to answer. We kind of agreed to share you, with an awkward smile and her hand on the back of her head. Nodding her head, Toru added, and by we, 
She means all the girls in our class. Yairozu and Mina have some stuff they need to sort out, but we all agreed that it would be better if we just gave it a go and tried to make things work out. If they don't, we'll at least be a lot more prepared for the future, thanks to your quirk. That's a very pragmatic way of looking at things. Admit it is a coup, but it also puts a lot of pressure on me. I'm just one guy. Even if I'm confident in my capabilities, I can't handle a relationship with six different women. I already have limited free time and rarely get to hang out with other guys, even from our class. It's a real concern. Offering a curt nod. So you revealed. We thought of that. Yairozachan is going to become your manager since the two of you already spend time together as class and vice class representatives, Ribbit. She'll keep track of your schedule and let us know when you have an opening. The rest of the time, we'll focus on our studies and training to become heroes. That's the reason we enrolled in UA, Ribbit. Though the thought of having Yairozu as a secretary tickled him pink, Izuka didn't think things would work out nearly as conveniently as Tsuyu made it seem. It might work if all the girls openly communicated with one another, but he knew that Toru, at the very least, would try to sneak some advantages. Shaking his head, Izuka said, Forget it. I'm not going to complain if a bunch of cute girls have agreed to share me. If things don't work out, we'll deal with it then. Offering another nod, Tsuyu affirmed, That's probably for the best, Ribbit. Now, what do you want us to do? Should we take our clothes off? Smiling wryly, Izuko answered, As much as I would like to see that, my room isn't sound, much less shockproof. My workshop is, but there are cameras that I can't turn off due to the school's bylaws. Oh, muttered Tsuyu, once again becoming dispirited. She might look calm on the surface, but it had taken her a lot of courage to follow Izuku to his home. If all they did were study together, her bravado would have been for naught. Providing a somewhat awkward glimmer of hope, Achiko raised her hand and suggested, We can go to my apartment. Normally, we wouldn't even be at the station by now, so there's plenty of time. With all three girls looking to him for his response, Izuku felt he had no choice but to answer. Sounds good. My Kachan will probably be a little suspicious, but I wouldn't be much of a boyfriend if I refused an invitation from three of my girlfriends. Speaking of which, meeting Tsuyu's gaze, Izuka surprised her by asking, Do you want to smooch Tsuchan? You know, to make things official. I've already smooched Achiko and Toru, so it's only fair. As her tongue was hanging out slightly before Izuka spoke to her, Tsuyu sucked it back into her mouth with a flip, answering, If you're okay with it, Ribbit, exhaling a light chuckle. Izuku extended his hand toward Tsuyu, teasing, Just don't give me too much tongue if we French kiss. Also, don't be too surprised when I touch your butt. I've wanted to for a long time. Though her expression didn't change much, a faint blush spread through Tsuyu's cheeks as she accepted Izuka's outstretched hand. She tensed when he pulled her into his embrace and immediately placed his hands on her butt. But since Izuka had warned her, she just raised her head, closed her eyes, and waited to be smooched. Luckily, she didn't have to wait long, staring at the clock on her bedroom wall, Mirko, lying on her stomach with the lower half of her face pressed to the covers she and Izuka had shabbowinged atop more than a hundred times groaned, I wonder if that brat is out of class yet, annoyed by her utterance. Mirko rolled onto her back, exposing her racks and belly to the air as she placed her forearm over her eyes. She had the air conditioner blowing icy cold air as hard as it could, but sweat covered her from head to toe as her body burned from the inside. Before Izuku came to intern with her, Mirko had been very careful about triggering her heat response. She even went out of her way to thoroughly embarrass her partners to ensure they wouldn't even think of trying to get in touch with her after the fact. The reason for that, other than because it was fun, was that she had a habit of getting addicted to the men she had high compatibility. It was difficult for her to find a dependable partner, so when she did, 
She drained them so thoroughly that they either ran out of town or begged her to leave them alone. After spending seven days with Izuku, shabowinking like rabbits at least 15 times a day, Mirko's body craved his touch. This was one of the reasons she chose to live so far away from other people. Because if Izuku was just a hop, skip, and a few jumps away, she was bound to dart over, kick down his wall, or burst in through his window. This sucks, groaned Mirko willing in vain, for her body to calm the hell down. Unfortunately, she was most active through the months of March and September. So with the current date being May 27th, her body had no intention of heeding her plea. What annoyed Mirko the most was that she would usually just find a guy to scratch her itch. However, after inviting Izuku over for his work study and giving him permission to ask her out once he became a pro, she felt a strange compulsion to wait for him. She didn't know if it was because of her boosted intellect, but she was even starting to think about the future a bit. Exhaling a steamy sigh, Mirko rolled onto her side and grabbed her phone for the umpteenth time. After unlocking it with her thumb, the first thing that came into view was a photo of Izuku, jaw clenched, face red, and brows creased as he made a bunny-eared gesture with his hands. More importantly, he was wearing her costume, the fee she had charged him for letting him keep the photo of her in a sailor uniform. Though her eyes narrowed and a faint smile adorned her face, Smirko muttered, I should never have let this brat come and intern with me. Then, with a legitimately angry expression, she growled, No, this is all that bastard principal's fault. He knew about my disposition, yet still sent me that damned email. It's obvious he just wanted to use me to test that brat's quirk, that son of a gun. Inadvertently cracking her phone due to her anger, Mirko shouted, Crap! Before rising to a seated position to better inspect the damage. It was still powered on, but the screen was cracked and half had gone completely black. Luckily, this wasn't the first time she had broken her phone, so she had an entire box of spares. If not, she would have been without the side dish she had been using throughout the day. If that happened, she might really lose her crap. You're really, really good at this. Vosasitka. Pulling her mouth away from Izuka's loins, Tsuyu uncoiled her tongue from around his 8-inch punisher and replied, It's because my throat is elastic and I don't have a gag reflex ribbit. My parents used to have to take me to the hospital when I was young because I kept swallowing things. I think the biggest was a magic 8-ball. Seeing the slack-jawed look on Izuka's face, Tsuyu tilted her head to the side and asked, was that too much information? Sorry, I have a habit of saying what's on my mind, Ribbit. Shaking his head, Izuku assured, No, it's fine. I'm happy to get to know more about you. It was just a little shocking, that's all. Offering a slight nod, Tsuyu grabbed the base of Izuka's meat grinder before extending her tongue to coil around it. She proceeded to show him just how skillful her long frog, like tongue was. Izuka didn't last long, blowing his load in mere seconds, releasing Izuka's meat grinder with one final suck. Tsuyu retracted her tongue, catching the former completely off guard as she asked, Want me to lick your you-know-what next? I heard it feels really good for guys, and my long tongue should let me reach your unreachable places easily, Ribbit. Ruffling Tsuyu's hair, Izuka smiled as he said, You're a little too eager, Tsuyu-chan. This isn't the last time we'll be together like this, so don't feel pressured to try everything all at once. Rather, now that you've gotten me more than ready to go, it's time I return the favor. Though she was tempted to go with the flow and let Izuka service her, Tsuyu shook her head and asserted, You should prepare Achiko-chan first. I'll go last, Ribbit. Tsuyu-chan, Izuka proceeded to prepare Achiko-kan, constantly peppering her, with smooches on her sensitive body and caressing her body made her experience pleasure beyond her imagination. Popping her cherry delicately, Izuku proceeded to clap her cheeks to high heavens, making Achiko to ultimately climax explosively, her mind going blank. This made her instinctively activate her quick, making Izuku completely flabbergasted 
as she rode her orgasmic pleasure towards the ceiling. Tsu Yu wanting in on the action, replaced Achiko chan She was the more flexible of the two, being able to handle him right from the get-go. Diving into what he could only describe as her non-Newtonian coochie made Suyu to constantly hum, releasing inaudible cute croaking sounds from the back of her throat. Izuka showed her the depths of carnal pleasure, all the while Toru was an involuntary participant, just feasting at the proceedings with a hungry gaze. With Tsuyu and Toru calling their parents, and ultimately receiving permission to spend the night at Achiko's, there was no longer as much pressure to wrap things up quickly. Izuka still needed to return home, but his mom had set his curfew at 9.30pm, since he was often out training or late after spending time at the development study. Thus, after giving Toru a thorough schmucking, Izuku had the three girls snuggled up to him as they read through the perks completely unclothed. Tsuyu couldn't see what they were looking at, but she didn't mind since she was the one who got to sit in Izuka's lap. That vector shift perk seems really useful, remarked Achiko, a serious expression on her face. Vector shift was an int-based perk that, similar to Toru's form projection, directly influenced how her quirk functioned. With it, she could point in a direction or squeeze her hand shut, and everything affected by her quirk would either fall in the indicated direction or gather around a central point. In other words, she could make things fly through the sky or send them straight up by simply gesturing. As for the rate at which things fell or more accurately accelerated, it was the same as the gravitational constant, 9.8m slash s caret 2. Nodding his head, Izuku affirmed, it's honestly a little OP. If you get the healthy body perk from 100 vit, you wouldn't have to worry about getting nauseous when using your power. If you then use your power on yourself and point in a direction, you can achieve a fairly effective form of flight. Feeling a little envious, Toru puffed out her cheeks and said, Your quirk is really amazing, Achiko-chan. Answering in Achiko's stead, Izuku argued, Your form projection is also borderline broken, Toru. You're currently using it over yourself. But if you wanted to, you could project your form away from your actual location. If you utilize it cleverly, your opponents literally won't know what hit them. Nestling her head against Izuka's shoulder, Toru hummed, That's one of the things I adore about you, izuka Cohen. You always know what to say to get me nice and wet. Resisting the urge to roll his eyes, Izuku planted a smooch atop Toru's head before continuing to help Achiko pick out her perks. There wasn't a way to remove or change them after the fact, so it was an important decision as it would affect her entire life. Fortunately, there was no need to choose them all at once, so Achiko settled on just healthy body since she didn't have enough IP to boost her into 100. Name, Achiko Urarika. Quirk, zero gravity. Bond level, 84. Current level, 18. Effective level, 33. Attributes, strength, 29. Agility, 30. Vitality, 44 to 100. Intelligence, 40 to 86. Dexterity, 36. Luck, 53. Free attributes, 0. Perks, healthy body. Feeling a pleasant sensation spread through her body, accompanied by a sense of awareness. Achiko had a very content look on her face as she remarked, This feels amazing. It's like all my stress and fatigue is melting away. Adopting a teasing smile, Toru remarked, With 86 intelligence, studying for the finals will be a cakewalk. Though you're still not as smart as I am, you fuffed de. Narrowing her eyes, Achiko replied, that's not very nice, Toru-chan. Then, regaining her bubbly demeanor, she smiled radiantly and nestled up to Izuko, adding, Thank you for this, izuka Coin. Not just a boost to my attributes and my new perk, but allowing me, all of us, to be with you. I felt I was being pretty self-centered these past few weeks, so I'm glad we're finally able to be together for real. Though he still had many doubts about the present situation, Izuka couldn't help smiling in response to Achiko's words. He couldn't imagine a harem working in his previous world, 
but now that he was in an anime, potentially even in a roge, it didn't seem too outlandish. After all, he had basically stumbled his way into a harem situation, something that would have been impossible in his previous life, that alone suggested it wasn't completely inconceivable that things would work out. Breaking Izuku from his delusions, Tsuyu raised her head, looking up at him as she asked, are the three of you done messing around with your little system thingy? If so, wanna go another round, Ribbit? As it was only around 7.20pm, meaning he still had around two hours to return home, Izuku didn't hesitate to reply, There are a few things I would enjoy more. Though it was already after 10pm, Izuku was taking his time to return home, enjoying what remained of the cool spring air with his hands in his pockets. He had already called his mom to inform him he would be a little late, so it wouldn't matter if he were 10 to 15 minutes later. VRRRR, hmm. Thinking Achiko, Toru, and Tsuyu were calling him, Izuku pulled out his phone with a bit of expectation. What he never expected to see was that the notification came from Mirko, saved as Rumi Yusujiyama in his phone. No way, muttered Izuku quickly thumbing open the message to see what his favorite bunny had to say. Shove a carrot up your butt and die. Well, that was unexpected, thought Izuku, quickly responding with a cheeky pass. I don't want to make you even angrier. To Izuku's surprise, Mirko responded almost immediately, offering her usual cheeky brat, before adding, you have to come to me for your work study. If you don't, I'll find a random muscle head to shaboink and send you the video. Reading Mirko's message, Izuku immediately stopped in his tracks. He basically had to conduct his work study with Night Eye if he wanted to save Eri. But if Mirko actually followed through on her threat, he would lose his crap. She was her own woman and had every right to sleep with whoever she wanted. But if he saw her with another man, Izuku knew he would be pissed. Deciding to take a gamble, Though it was a relatively safe bet knowing Mirko's personality, Izuku replied, I refuse. Once again, responding instantly, Mirko asked, What the hell did you just say? Clearing up the misunderstanding, Izuku quickly typed, All Might has already arranged to have me conduct my work study with his former sidekick, Sir Naitai. As much as I want to return to you, I can't betray his expectations and trust. Unlike her previous message, Mirko didn't immediately respond, allowing Izuka to add, Summer break is coming up. I'm busy during the first and second weeks, but I should be able to come over after that. Then do that, replied Mirko nearly as soon as Izuka had sent his text. He never took her for a fast texter, but it wasn't too surprising with how high her dexterity was, adopting a faint smile. Izuku decided to try his luck, typing, I will, but you know, if you really want to see me, you could always become a teacher at UA. I actually live on the campus, so we'd be able to see each other every day. Unsurprisingly, as soon as Izuku sent his text, Mirko responded with a curt, F you. However, just as he was about to put his phone away, she added, I don't have a teaching license and I dropped out of high school. Even if that rat principal made an exception, a lot of people would find it suspicious. Blinking in surprise, Izuka thought to himself, Holy crap, did she actually think I was serious? Leaving Izuku even more speechless than he already was, Mirko ended their conversation by adding, Once you're done doing whatever it is you have planned with that poindexter, come to do a work study in Hiroshima. If you're not completely hopeless by then, I'll teach you for real. Though the little icon under Mirko's PFPF indicated she had closed the chat, Izuka still typed out, I'll be looking forward to, before placing his phone back in his pocket, the smile on his face broader than ever. Early the next morning, Izuka showed up to class with a smile and a bit of swagger in his step. There, he found Yairozu reading through her math textbook, but the moment he entered the classroom, she rose to her feet hands folded over her lap as she said, Good morning, Midoriya-kun. I see you're in good spirits. Did your group study with Hagakirsen, Ajui-san, and Yuraka-san go well? Nodding his head, Izuku practically beamed as he replied, 
It was a very productive session. At this rate, Toru's and Achiko's grades will improve by leaps and bounds. At the very least, they won't have any trouble with the written exams. That's good to hear, replied Yairozu. Then, pulling out a tablet-like PDA, she asked, Did they inform you of our arrangement? We may have been a little presumptuous, but I hope you'll at least consider having me. If not as a partner and manager, then the latter. You have my word that I will give it my all and do my best to abstain from partiality. Exhaling a very faint sigh, the smile on Azuka's face only became more prominent as he replied, You know, I consider you the most beautiful girl in class. Since the six of you are willing to try and make things work, I'm not going to overcomplicate things. Rather, I feel incredibly fortunate and would be honored to have you, Momo. Not expecting Izuku to use her first name, much less without honorifics. Momo tensed as she stood a little straighter. Immediately afterward, a radiant smile blossomed across her face as she replied, I pray we enjoy a long and fortuitous relationship. Fiflifo. As simply addressing Izuku by his name was a little too advanced for her, causing her cheeks to flush slightly, Momo tacked on an honorific at the very end. Then, before he could ask, she held up the PDA with both hands, asking, Do you use a planner or scheduling app of some sort? If so, Please send me an invitation and confer me admin permissions. After that, I would appreciate it if you could apprise me of my stats. I'm curious to know and would like to keep track of my growth from here on. Responding with a nod, Izuka replied, Sure, sounds good. You'll be able to check them yourself once our bond reaches 80 and we're in the same party. But I don't mind telling you what they are. Name Momo Yairo's of Quirk Creation Bond Level 69. Current level, 21. Effective level, 30. Attributes. Strength, 38. Agility, 35. Vitality, 123. Intelligence, 77. Dexterity, 49. Luck, 88. Free attributes, 105. Perks, uh, party invitation required. After recording each of her attributes, as Izuku read them, Momo felt compelled to ask, You mentioned that 80 was the threshold for joining your party. Can that only be attained by Shabo Inking? Though he vaguely recalled Mirko having more than 80 bond before they had Shabo Inked, Izuku wasn't certain answering. I'm honestly not sure. It hasn't been long since I discovered this aspect of my ability. I can attest that Shabbo inking isn't a surefire method to attain the qualifications for joining my party. Because of her apprehensions, Tsuyu is currently sitting at 73 bond, even after willfully trying to increase it. In other words, we can't fake it. Hmm, I see, replied Momo, a serious, contemplative expression on her face. Because of my family circumstances, Shabbo inking is difficult. I have made arrangements to introduce you to my parents and grandfather, but you would need to sign a marriage certificate before we can shaboink. That's the main reason I was chosen as your manager, as I wouldn't be a contender for your affection. Seeing the slightly wide-eyed look on Izuka's face, Momo's expression softened as she added, Worry not. My parents and grandfather are very understanding and supportive of my decisions. Also, even if we're unable to shaboink, I can service you in other ways. I did some personal research once everyone else had left and discovered there was quite a bit more to intimacy than simply shaboinking. Leaning forward slightly, a ruddy hue spread through Momo's cheeks as she asked, Did you know there are people that actually use back there to feign intercourse? My initial impression is that it would be unhygienic but there are steps you can take to ensure its cleanliness. Realizing that Momo was alluding to anal, Izuku found himself restraining a chuckle as he replied, Yes, I was aware. There are even tools you can use to prepare in advance. Nodding her head, Momo revealed, Yes, I looked into it last night. Thus, please inform me two weeks ahead of time if you'd like to try it. It would also be helpful 
if you could provide me with the dimensions of your meat grinder. I fear a terrible tragedy might occur if my preparations are lacking. Though Momo's roundabout way of talking about shabowinking wasn't surprising, Izuka found himself at a loss for how forward she was. But then again, she always was a very prudent woman. It made sense that she was giving the matter due consideration. Well, I certainly wouldn't be against trying it, replied Izuku. Just don't push yourself on my behalf. Even if it takes a few months before you're ready, I'm more than willing to wait. Just let me know when you're feeling confident and we can give it a try then. Adopting a radiant smile that didn't suit the subject they were discussing, Momo replied, Very well. I will begin making preparations and inform you when I'm ready. Thank you for being so considerate, Izuka Kuen. I'll do my best not to disappoint you. Smiling wryly, Izuka asserted. The only way you could disappoint me is if you wanted to, Momo. Try not to beat yourself up or apologize too much, or it might harm your self-esteem. You're at your best when confident and in control. I also prefer you that way. So please don't change. I, I see. Replied Momo, her expression appearing incomparably bashful before a smile as radiant as the sun developed across her face. Standing straighter as she replied, Then I'll give it my... Allow me to correct myself. Let's give it our all together, Izuka Kuen. You, me, and all the girls in class 1A. Though he felt Momo's words would have had a greater impact if she didn't mention everyone else. Izuku returned a broad smile, catching her a little off guard as he proposed, Then shall we make things official with a kiss? After blinking several times in surprise, Momo reverted to her bashful state, shrinking in on herself and averting her eyes as she meekly replied, But we're at school. Surely it would be better to officiate things later in a more appropriate setting. Nodding his head, Izuku casually replied, if that's what you think, then that's what we'll do. If you're really going to be my manager, you'll need to speak your mind and assert yourself. Don't let me run all over you and pressure you into doing things you're not comfortable with, okay? Exhaling a relieved sigh, Momo gave her chest a comforting pat before perking up and replying, I'll be sure to keep that in mind, with a bright smile on her face. With the girls reaching the consensus that it probably wasn't a good idea if their relationship with Izuku was made public, things went surprisingly smoothly for the latter. He expected Mina or Toru to pester him or Jiro to react timidly when he greeted her. But everyone behaved normally. It was honestly a little uncanny, but as he was no stranger to acting, Izuku didn't mind the change. It certainly made things easier. Spurred by his conversation with Momo, Izuku defaulted to his old habit of inspecting everyone he saw with his quirk. As a result, he found that he had a bond level with everyone, not just the girls. Since there was no way in hell that he was going to bone a dude, the implication was that shabowinking was not a requirement for joining his party. It was just an especially effective way to strengthen his bond with certain girls. Curiously enough, the person Izuku had the strongest bond with, at least among the guys in his class, was Todoroki. The two rarely interacted with each other since the sports festival, but the icy cold youth was sitting at a bond level of 74, presumably out of 100. Izuku presumed this as the lowest he had inspected thus far was 23, belonging to Mineta, a Cretan he was fairly certain hated his guts. Surprising him even more than Todoroki's apparent fondness for him, the fourth period gave Izuku a rather sizable shock when Midnight entered the classroom for their bi-weekly modern hero art history class. Name, Namuri Kiyama, Quirk, Somnambulist, Bond Level, 91, Current Level, 26, Effective Level, 38, Attributes, Strength, 30, Agility, 34. Vitality, 110. Intelligence, 68. Dexterity, 50. Luck, 105. Free attributes, 130. Perks, uh, party invitation required. After seeing Midnight's inordinately high bond level, 
The notion that there were multiple types of bonds entered Azuka's mind. He was fairly certain that Midnight didn't have genuine feelings for him, and there was also the example of Mirko. The latter was clearly attracted to him, but Izuka knew she would cut ties with him the moment he sincerely pissed her off. If Izuka had to guess, Midnight's bond level was the result of her nature and the fact she was aware of his relationship with the girls in his class. He didn't think Nizu had informed her about his quirk, but she may have heard about his ability to empower the women he slept with. That wasn't the case, but Izuku had just found out that the previous evening, so there was no way others would know. Though it was too late to change course, Izuku couldn't help thinking, damn, if I had known what this world was like, I wouldn't have focused my efforts on the girls in class. If he had known that his chances with Mirko and other mature females were even a few percent higher than his projections, Izuku would have gone the confident and cheeky route, not the casual and complimentary route he had chosen. Unfortunately, though he suspected that Midnight might be DTF, Izuka hadn't been lying to the girls when he told them he didn't believe in two-timing. He might be dating six of them at once, but he wouldn't go behind their backs to try and seduce other women. After all, they had already made concessions in regards to Mirko and, somewhat surprisingly, May. So he wasn't going to push his luck. Even if Midnight was his number two among all the girls in the Boku no Hero Academia world. With morning classes and lunch passing without incident, Class 1A was surprised when the door to their classroom opened with vigor, followed by a familiar I am here, followed by a much quieter, coming through the door like a normal person. As it was an excellent opportunity, Izuka decided to take a good look at Toshinori's status. His eyes widened a bit when he saw how weak Toshi had become, but it was nothing compared to the expectation and sheer excitement he felt when he saw the man's bond level and the number of free attribute points he possessed. Name, Tashinori Yagi. Quirk, Transfer Vestige, Stockpiling Vestige, Singularity Vestige. Bond level, 100. Current level, 20,108. Effective level, 44,325. Attributes, Strength, 179,242. Agility, 37,001. Vitality, 200,499. Intelligence, 69. Dexterity, 26,331. Luck, 108. Free attributes, 100,540. Perks, party invitation required. In the wake of afternoon heroics training, Izuka caught up to Tashinori as he attempted his usual hasty exit, calling out, Please wait a moment, All Might Sensei. Since they were already out of view of the other students, Tashinori allowed his muscle form to dissipate, forcing a smile as he asked, What is it, Midoriya, my boy? This isn't the best for a chat. I'm well aware of that, replied Izuku. I just felt compelled to call out to you, since I've made a very important discovery. If Principal Nizu isn't too busy, we should head to his office immediately. Nodding his head, Tashinori pulled out his cell phone, ringing up Niza's private line as he asked, Mind telling me what this is about? You appear pretty excited. Smiling broadly, Izuku unhesitantly revealed, I think my power might be able to heal you. Spitting up a concerning amount of blood, Tashinori's eyes widened as he nearly shouted, Are you serious? Just how many more surprises are you going to give me? Rubbing the back of his head, Izuku replied, I'll explain in greater detail once we meet with the principal, but I'd say the odds are pretty favorable. Once you hear what I have to say, you'll understand. Nodding a second time, Tashinori waited for the phone to connect before simply stating, we need to meet. It's important. Considering how quickly Tashinori hung up, it was safe to assume Nizu had agreed to meet them. This was confirmed when the formed adopted a broad smile and said, Thank you for this, Midoriya. Even if it turns out your power can't treat my condition, you've given me a ray of hope for the first time in six years. If it turns out you are able to treat me, I promise to dedicate the remainder of my life to training and ensuring your success as the next symbol of peace. 
Exhaling a light chuckle, Izuku asked, Weren't you already doing that? I would much rather you worry about yourself more. You keep pushing me to live life to the fullest, but it's not all that convincing since you treat your own life with such disregard. If this works out, be a proper mentor and set an example for me, will you? Midoriya, feeling equal parts pride and choked up. Tashinori had to wipe his eyes with the back of his forearm. He was secretly concerned that Izuku was becoming a bit of a deviant, but now he knew for certain he had chosen the right person to succeed one for all. Izuku was far from perfect, but his concern for others never failed to shine through. Though he had to walk out of an important meeting midway, Nizu was all smiles when he heard Izuka's explanation and learned of the possibility of treating Tashinori's injuries. Exhibiting his excitement, Nizu's voice was much higher than usual as he said, This is fantastic news, Midoriya Kuin. Truly, indisputably amazing. I know, right? replied Izuku, unable to keep a proud smile from his face. This applied to Tashinori as well. So the atmosphere within the principal's office was exceptionally warm, borderline festive as the three beamed like idiots. Forcing himself to settle down, though still smiling, Niza said, then if possible, please proceed. I don't want to get too excited before we can confirm your hypothesis. Nodding his head, Izuka replied, all right, before turning his attention to Tashinori and asking, Tashinori Yagi, would you like to join my party? Before the notification window could even pop up, Tashinori replied, Of course, with such vigor that he transformed into his muscular form. As a result, the window never appeared. Instead, his status screen popped up, prompting his brows to rise as he remarked, Oh, so this is what you see when you utilize your quirk. It really is like a game. Spurred by Tashinori's remark, Nizu mused, How enviable. I am beyond curious about Midoriya-kun's abilities, but I don't believe our bond is very strong due to my skeptical nature. With Nizu looking toward him, Izuka knew the diminutive cat bear mouse was asking him to confirm his assertion. Unfortunately, that was precisely what he did, as Nizu's bond level could best be described as neutral. Name. Subject 301. Quirk. High spec. Bond level. 53. Current level. 8. Effective level. 82. Attributes. Strength. 2. Agility. 17. Vitality. 33. Intelligence. 551. Dexterity. 41. Luck. 183. Free attributes. 40. Perks. Uh, party invitation required. That's a real shame, remarked Nizu. Fortunately, it shouldn't take too long for me to trust you implicitly. You've been very forthright thus far, and if this matter with Tashinorikin is settled properly, I will feel very grateful toward you. Adopting a somewhat self-deprecating smile, Izuka replied, Don't worry about it, Niza-sensei. I truthfully don't even trust myself all that much, especially given recent developments, so I can't blame you for having suspicions. I just keep doing my best and hoping everything works out. Offering a slight, approving nod, Niza hummed. I suppose that's all any of us can do in the grand scheme of things. Now, please proceed with the experiment. I imagine we're all quite eager to see the outcome. Returning a nod of his own, Izuka shifted his gaze to Tashinori, drawing the latter's attention as he said, You should revert to your original form. The available perks depend on your base stats, and we'll want to observe any effects immediately. Okay, replied Tashinori, immediately reverting back to his skeletal form. As he did so, Izuku was forced to inhale a sharp breath, as it was his first time seeing the man's base stats. Name, Tashinori Yagi, Quirk, Transfer Vestige, Stockpiling Vestige, Singularity Vestige, Bond Level, 100. Current level, 20,108. Effective level, 68. Attributes, strength, 9. Agility, 5. Vitality, 480. Intelligence, 69. Dexterity, 
11. Luck, 108. Free attributes, 100,540. Perks, uh, party invitation required. Though Toshinori's vitality was surprisingly high, all things considered, this was Azuka's first time seeing someone whose effective level was a lot lower than their base. So how is it? asked Toshinori. Do you think you'll be able to heal me? Blinking back to awareness, Izuku explained, We'll first need to distribute your free attributes to increase your base stats. We'll be looking for perks pertaining to your physical condition and constitution. So your best option is to invest everything in vitality, or evenly distribute your attributes across strength, agility, vitality, and dexterity. A few points in intelligence would also benefit you tremendously, regardless of the outcome. Deciding to go with Izuku's suggestion, Tashinori allocated 25,000 IP to each of his physical attributes, boosted his intelligence to 100, and put the remainder in luck. He wasn't interested in being a peerless genius or anything, and he had long since decided to entrust the torch to the next generation. If he could have just a few good years without pain, he would be more than happy. If Izuku had been aware of Tashinori's thoughts, he would have been tempted to remind the man that AFO uh, was likely still around. Passing on the torch to the next generation was a noble sentiment. But when there was a 150-year-old superpowered grandpa running around, his influence spanning multiple generations, the old guard had little choice but to stay in the game. This is incredible, bellowed Tashinori, wide-eyed and with a massive, awe-filled smile on his face. It had taken hours due to the sheer number that was present but there was a perk among the 10,000 vitality options called Regression that stood out among the rest. At the cost of 2,470 of his levels, he had been able to reverse the flow of time for his body. He hadn't regained the powers of one for all, but his physical condition had effectively reverted to what it was before his climactic battle with All for One. The only downside was that the experience required to reach the next level remained the same, meaning he couldn't just use the perk to extend his life indefinitely. Name, Tashinori Yagi. Quirk, Transfer, Vestige. Stockpiling, Vestige. Singularity, Vestige. Bond level, 100. Current level, 17,638. Effective level, 105,525. Attributes, Strength, 338,491. Agility, 101,004. Vitality, 511,417. Intelligence, 100. Dexterity, 103,668. Luck, 579. Free attributes, 0. Perks, Pinnacle Body, Slipstream, Kinetic Energy Conversion, Perfect Condition, Regression, Crisis Awareness. Seeing what Tashinori's stats had become, largely thanks to the boosts provided by Pinnacle Body and Perfect Condition. Nezuka couldn't help thinking he had created a monster more ridiculous than All Might. With Slipstream and Kinetic Energy Conversion, Tashinori could accumulate power by simply moving around, releasing it in the form of shockwaves that were not different from one for all. And with Crisis Awareness, he basically had a sixth sense for when a major incident was about to occur allowing him to react even before it happened. Breaking Izuku from his days, Tashinori, appearing like a slightly younger version of his muscled self, even in his base form, gave the former a tight hug, shouting, Thank you, young Midoriya, with tears streaming down his face. He hadn't felt this grateful since his master took him in as a child, so Tashinori was beside himself with sentiment as he smothered Izuku in his powerful embrace. You're crushing me! croaked Izuku, even though Tashinori was properly controlling his strength. He just didn't enjoy being hugged by men, much less one with a physique that could shame bodybuilders. He could endure a bit for Tashinori's sake, as he was also feeling fairly sentimental, but he would prefer it if someone like Midnight or Mirko embraced him. Though he didn't release Izuku immediately, Tashinori eventually heeded the former's protests, keeping his hands on the younger boy's shoulders as he looked him directly in the eyes and said, I mean it, kid. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. 
Rolling his visibly watery eyes, Izuku replied, You're such a sap, in a somewhat subdued tone. Then, before Tashinori could say anything else, he met the man's gaze and reiterated, Don't mess this up trying to play hero. You've all but retired at this point, so at least pretend to take it easy these next few years. If anyone has earned a break, it's you. Midoriya, feeling more choked up than ever, Tashinori's face scrunched up in a vain attempt to hold back his tears. Izuku had basically given him his life back. So while he originally planned to increase his patrol time from 3 to 8 hours a day, he decided to limit it to 5. He wouldn't be able to ignore those in need, but he wouldn't push himself nearly as hard as he used to. After all, he was supposed to be making way for the future generation, not barring the course. With Nizu asking him to stay back for a bit, Izuku saw Tashinori off before returning to the principal's office to hear what the diminutive cat bear mouse had to say. To his immense surprise, Nizu revealed, Before today's revelations, I had asked Kiyama, uh, I mean Midnight Sensei, if she were willing to give you personal instruction to ensure you did not inadvertently harm those who would receive your power. Your situation is very peculiar, so I believed it was necessary. Tell me, izuka Kuin, how do you feel about such an arrangement? Adopting a wry smile, Izuka replied, I would be lying if I said I wasn't very tempted, Nisa-sensei. However, I promised everyone I wouldn't sneak around behind their backs no matter what. It's also not strictly necessary to confirm my powers, so I will have to politely refuse. Nodding his head in approval, Nisa remarked, I thought you might say that. However, there appears to have been a slight misunderstanding. While the instruction would be centered around you, your classmates, specifically your female classmates, would also be in attendance. It was intended to be a practical demonstration of what to do and what not to do as you deepen your relationships with one another. This is definitely a world based on an eroge, thought Izuku, remaining completely silent in response to Niza's words. Seeing the blank expression on Izuka's face, Niza's own became slightly apologetic as he revealed, Truth be told, I thought you had already been made aware of this. I'm surprised none of the girls in your class informed you about it, as it was one of the things they discussed during yesterday's lesson. It seems they are quite good at keeping secrets. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, You're saying the girls know and have agreed to participate? Responding with a nod, Niza clarified, It was an arrangement made under the assumption that you had to sleep with the person who would receive your boons. Your power was set to become an important asset in the ongoing war against All for One and his faithful, so I believed it was necessary to make certain arrangements. I apologize if I've made things more difficult for you. Shaking his head, Izuku was serious as he replied, It's fine. I'm the type to take things in stride, so I'll just go with the flow and give it my all, just as I always have. Besides, I'm not exactly disenchanted by the notion of receiving lessons from Midnight Sensei. So long as the girls are okay with it, I see no reason to refuse. Breathing a faint sigh of relief, Nizu regained his usual business-like smile as he said, Then that's all I have for you today. The demonstration will take place this Sunday at 9am. I hope you and your classmates learn a lot. Rising to his feet, Izuku gave his usual bow before raising his head and replying, I'm certain we will, with an awkward but expectant smile on his face. As he departed the principal's office and made his way home, Izuku pulled out his phone to see if he had any messages. The girls had invited him to a group chat with the six of them, so after skimming through the unread messages, quite a few teasing him, he typed, I heard about the extra class this Sunday. Responding almost immediately, Mina asked, Seriously? How'd you find out? Midnight Sensei said it was being kept a secret to surprise you. Since his relationship and special treatment from the principal were now well known among the girls, Izuku replied, I heard about it from Principal Nizu. That little rat, responded Mina, subsequently asking, Why were you even in his office? You disappeared pretty early after classes let out. Instead of lying, 
Izuku honestly replied, I experienced a breakthrough of sorts with my quirk. Thanks for that, by the way, Momo. Our conversation this morning helped me understand a lot of things. As she was part of the ongoing conversation, Momo happily replied, I'm happy to have been of assistance. While Mina questioned, Oh, what's this? Did the two of you have a secret conversation before class? Sneaky, sneaky dot. Before Momo could provide clarification, Izuka typed out, It was mainly related to her becoming my manager. We also talked about my quirk and the future of our group as a whole. That sounds about right, replied Mina. You two are pretty serious when it comes to things like that. This is a pretty serious situation, typed Izuku. Our situation isn't exactly normal, so we'll need to put in a lot of effort to ensure things work. I don't want any of you getting hurt. Though most of the girls had been content lurking, Izuka's remark caused everyone but Jiro to reply with some form of assurance. Mina teased him a bit, but she also asserted that everything would work out, so Izuku felt they were all on the same page. If they were serious about making things work, they would need to be. Where's Jiro, by the way? Asked Izuku, noticing that her PFP was active, but that her only message was from when the group was first formed. In other words, she was still lurking. Having been called out, Jiro felt obligated to reply, it's a secret, before following up by adding, don't say a word, Mina. Bo, replied Mina, clearly intending to do exactly that. Then, instead of pressing the matter, she typed, I'm planning to volunteer if we get to do a practical this Sunday. Look forward to it, um K. Understanding what Mina meant when she said practical, Izuku jokingly remarked, Sunday suddenly seems a whole month away. You little flirt, replied Mina, adding, I actually feel it's way too close, lol. I'm a little nervous, even if Achiko, Toru, and Tsuyu have all mentioned it feels incredible. Since it was now very clear what they were talking about, the smile on Izuka's face softened as he typed, I'll be gentle. I promise. If you don't, Midnight Sensei might punish you, replied Mina. Though, perhaps you would like that? I heard Mirko bullied you pretty hard during your internship. Let's not talk about that here, typed Izuko. Telecommunications in the world of Boku no Hero Academia were a lot more secure than his previous one, but it was better to be safe than sorry. While continuing to chat with the girls, Izuko eventually arrived at his home, mentioning as much before placing his palm against the biometric scanner. Then, before he could even call out to greet his mom, a familiar pink figure leaped in front of him, exclaiming, Surprise! with her hands raised high. Instead of startling as Mina had hoped he would, Izuku just stared at her with a blank expression, asking, What are you doing in my house? Puffing out her cheeks, albeit only for a moment, Mina regained her usual vigor and replied, What kind of reaction is that? Also, isn't it obvious why we came by? We're here to hang out and study. Before Izuku could ask who Mina was referring to when she said we, Jiro appeared from the living room, casually raising her hand as she offered a curt yo, before adding, sorry for intruding, your mom let us in. Following close behind Jiro, Inko had a smile that wasn't quite a smile as she cupped her cheek with half-narrowed eyes and said, welcome home, sweetie. You never told me you had so many adorable female friends from class, Yafufa dot, feeling a shiver run up his spine. Izuka's smile became visibly cramped as he replied, It's complicated, shaking his head. Izuku promptly decided it was better to be honest, his expression turning serious as he added, Kachan, these two are my girlfriends, Mina Ashido and Kyokajiro. The three girls you met yesterday are also my girlfriends. Catching Izuku by surprise, Inko's smile broadened, her deep green eyes narrowing further as she replied, I am well aware of that, Izuka-chan. It isn't exactly normal for a boy to bring home three girls and then leave in such a hurry. Just make sure you don't do anything foolish, okay? I'm too young to be a grandmother. Finished with what she had to say, at least to Izuko, Inko turned her gaze to Mina and Jiro, causing the duo to tense as she added, Take care of my baby for me, will you? 
he's the only thing I have left in this world. Truly finished with what she had to say, Inko cast one final look at Izuku before excusing herself. An awkward silence lingered in her wake, but it eased a bit when Izuku grabbed the two girls' hands, smiling wryly as he suggested, We should probably go to my room. Your mom is really intense, said Mina, waiting until the door to Izuku's room was shut before speaking again. Yeah, replied Izuku. I already told you about the situation with my father, right? She basically had to raise me herself, so she can be a little overprotective at times. It didn't help that, up until I was 13, I didn't even have a quirk. Oh yeah, replied Mina. I completely forgot, but you've barely had your quirk for two years, huh? You've come a long way in such a short period. Though he gave an affirming nod, Izuku asserted. But I still have a long way to go. We all do, one way or another. Adopting a faint smile, Mina said. Speaking of which, Jiro and I really did come here to study. She's ranked 7th in the class, but I'm all the way down at rank 19. I'm hoping to be able to increase my intelligence before the final exams, but since our bond is only 63, I figured I shouldn't hedge my bets and study. As Izuku had shown each of them their status, Mina and Jiro had at least a basic idea of how they actually felt about him. Curiously enough, Jiro's bond was the higher of the two, initially set at 73 despite the fact she and Izuku rarely conversed, and had only teamed up once during their training. Even more curious, or perhaps amusing, when she learned of this truth, it immediately increased to 75. It's actually not that difficult to strengthen bonds, replied Izuko. Real, genuine sentiment takes time to cultivate, but intimacy and closeness go a long way. Take Jiro, for example. Seeing Izuko look directly at her, Jiro's body tensed before she hugged her body and averted her eyes, asking, What are you trying to get at? with a faint red hue spreading through her cheeks. Adopting a gentle smile, Izuku asked, Mind if I hold you? Just for a few moments. Though her face abruptly became a lot redder, Jiro turned her eyes to meet Izuku's gaze. Her face still turned to the side as she replied, If it's only for a short while. Nodding his head, Izuku closed the distance between him and Jiro, wrapping his arms around her and holding her gently for several seconds. She was really tense at first, but as their embrace lingered, she gradually relaxed, prompting Izuku to whisper, Thank you for choosing to become my girlfriend. I love you, Kyuka, in a hushed tone that was only audible due to her enhanced hearing. Not expecting Izuku to suddenly confess, Jiro's body became as rigid as a statue, her complexion turning fiery as her earphone jacks began to coil and wriggle involuntarily. At the same time, her bond level abruptly shot up to 81, permitting Izuka to ask, Kyukajiro, would you like to join my party? When she eventually raised her face to meet his gaze, blinking in surprise, Kyuko was going to point out it was too soon, but stopped when a blue window appeared in front of her face. When it did, her momentarily bashful expression turned into a slightly annoyed pout as she said, you tricked me, now I look like an easy girl. While continuing to hold the petite, purple-haired rocker girl, Izuku shook his head, whispering, It wasn't a trick. Now that we've all come together like this, I intend to do everything I can to make you girls happy. In other words, unless you choose to break up with me, we could be spending the rest of our lives together. Though Izuku's words weren't exactly a proposal, Kyuka felt her heart rate increase tremendously. Her quirk made it impossible for her not to hear it, so her face became a concerning shade of crimson as her heart pounded like thunder within her ears. Exacerbating Kyuka's condition quite a bit, Izuka moved his face a little closer to hers, asking, Can I kiss you? with slightly narrowed eyes. In response, Kyuka's practically developed swirls as she instinctually pulled her head away from him. Instead of pursuing Kyuk's lips, Izuka's expression softened as he said, Some other time then, before weakening his hold on her body. Kyuka was a very sensitive girl, 
a stark contrast to the unenthusiastic, borderline apathetic mask she had developed for public use. Her quirk permitted her to listen in on hushed conversations, so she had always been privy to the true nature of people in her surroundings. She had learned to tune things out with the help of music, but by doing so, she had isolated herself from the rest of the world. At the very least, that was the case until she joined class, Wana. Just as Izuku released his hold on her body, Kyuka grabbed his shirt, whispering, Wait! As she turned her eyes to look up at him. That was the only thing she said, but her intentions were made fairly obvious when she swallowed audibly, returning his hands to their position on Kyuka's lower back. Izuka held her gently and tenderly for several seconds, staring into her eyes as they slowly drew closer to one another. It took nearly 30 seconds, but their lips did eventually meet, culminating in a chaste smooch that lasted for a few seconds before Kyuka pulled away from him, covering her face with her hands as illusory steam rose from her head. Seeing the unexpectedly intimate interaction between Izuku and Kyuka, Mina found herself at a rare loss for words. She had expected something to happen when she and Jiro decided to come to his room, but she never expected things to get so tense so quickly. Turning to meet Mina's gaze, Izuka's expression softened even further as he mouthed the numbers 6 and 8. Mina was a little confused at first, but it didn't take long for her to realize what he was referring to when he nudged his head toward Jiro and mouthed the numbers 8 and 3. It was Izuka's way of informing her that her bond level had increased to 68 just by watching his and Jiro's interaction. Could it really be that easy? Wondered Mina. Or do I just get turned on from watching other people make out? Instead of pondering further on the matter, Mina promptly dismissed it, adopting one of her characteristically impish grins, asking, Is it my turn now? In a teasing tone that belied the fact she was shaking, albeit only a little. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.